Good morning, and I would like to welcome everybody to today's Health Scrutiny Committee, including everyone present here in the Council Chamber and those who are listening online. Before we begin, for those of us in the Council Chamber, there is no fire drill planned this morning. In the event of the fire alarm sounding, we need to leave the Council Chamber through the rear doors, through reception, and assemble in the car park at the front of the building and await further instructions. I would also like to welcome Councillor Colin Matthews, who is attending via Teams as the Executive Support Councillor for NHS Liaison, Community Engagement, Registration and Coroner's Services. Other participants will be introduced when we reach their item. I would also like to ask for all mobile phones to be switched off or placed on silent, please. This meeting is not being streamed in the usual way, but an audio recording will be uploaded to the website after the meeting. I'd now like to move into agenda item one, Apologies for absence and replacement members. Trina. Thank you, Chairman. We have received apologies from Councillor Rosemary, Cabri Brown, Robert Reed, and Glynis Galazi. But we have uh, a replacement member for Councillor Cabri Brown. Councillor Mark Whittington is here on her behalf today. We've also had apologies from Councillor Sue Woolley, Executive Councillor for NHS Liaison, Community Engagement, Registration and Coroners. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Trina. And uh, welcome, Mark. Nice to have you back. So. Thank you. Uh, we'll move into agenda item two, declarations of members' interest. Do members have any interest to declare, please? No? Yep. Councillor White. Um, just to say that I've received an email which I believe has been sent to all members of the Health Scrutiny Committee from a member of the Grantham Support Group. Yes, thank you, Councillor White. I believe it's been sent to all members. I haven't had the opportunity to see it as of yet because I believe it came in quite late last night. And unfortunately, my laptop is actually with one of our officers now um, being upgraded. So I'll have a good look at that after the meeting. Thank you. Uh, in which case, I'd like to move on to agenda item three, the minutes from the 15th of September. I'd like to confirm the minutes of the meeting as correct from pages three to 14 of the agenda pack. As the committee have had the opportunity to read these in advance of the meeting, I am planning on taking these on block. Is there a proposer, please, for these? Councillor Ray Wotton, thank you for proposing that. And seconded, Councillor Linda Wotton. All those in favour, could you please show? Thank you, they're supported. Any abstentions? Thank you, Councillor Whittington and Dr Thompson. OK, in which case we'll move into agenda item four, the chairman's announcements. My chairman's announcements have been circulated with the agenda and my supplementary announcements were emailed on the 12th of October. Are there any questions in regards to these? Councillor Wotton. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, can I re refer you to your supplementary chairman's announcements regarding COVID? I, I'm quite concerned that cases, in, particularly in schools amongst children, are rising, particularly in South Stephen. Is there anything that we can do as an authority to make the make the them aware of the need to wear masks in schools? I know masks are not obligatory, but something needs to be done to stop these cases increasing. Yes, certainly. I do share your concerns also, of course, at the moment, this committee doesn't deal with the school side of things. And I think it's probably worthwhile speaking to Councillor Kendrick and I'll have a conversation with him as to see what's going on from the children's side of things. Um, but uh, I think that's all I can say at the moment in time. Thank you. Chairman. OK, in which case, do I have a proposal that we note the chairman's announcements? Thank you, Councillor Linda Wotton. Seconded, Councillor Allen. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. That's supported. Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you. In which case, I'll now move on to the meeting conduct. Before we move into the substantive part of the meeting, I would ask that you keep your questions and contributions succinct and concise, ideally no more than two questions per person per item. And I would also like to stress the importance of treating all our contributors today with respect and to bear in mind our role as constructive scrutineers. I'd now like to move into agenda item five, the Lincolnshire Acute Services Review, the introduction to the consultation and arrangements for response. This can be found at pages 19 to 98 of the agenda back. And our presenters we have today from the Lincolnshire Clinical Commissioning Group are John Turner, Chief Executive, 
and Charlie Blythe, Director of Communications and Engagement. We also have a presenter in case of technical questions of Tom Diamond, Associate Director of Strategy for the Lincolnshire Clinical Commissioning Group, who is joining us via Teams. Before we move into the presentation, I would like to ask for Jody Clark to come forward as she's asked to raise a question with the committee and uh, address us. So I'm going to have three minutes and I'd like to hand over now. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Jodie Clark and I started the Fighting for Grantham Hospital community campaign. Um, we originally started um, because we opposed the overnight closure of the A&E uh, and over the five years we've attended so many meetings uh, and read loads of reports to try and understand the complexities of providing health services in a large rural county. And now I um, understand that the providers are in between a rock and a hard place, um, that there are troubles with recruitment and retention, as well as providing services across a large rural county. But of course, this then impacts all of us as patients. So um, it's just as difficult for us to travel to other areas. And already for Grantham residents, we have a number of things that we have to travel for already. So under the public consultation, the two areas um, that are in regards to Grantham, the acute, um, the urgent treatment centre and the um, acute beds. Um, they say under the proposals that uh, they are estimating 600 patients will have to be transferred, which our concerns are that that's on top of already um, the patients that are already having to travel. Um, I think that it's important that if they're not going to provide the A&E because we don't have the backup services uh, that we used to have, that the urgent treatment centre is as comprehensive as it can possibly be, that it's open 24-7 with walk-in access and that um, it has got consultant cover and medical grade doctors um, to support uh, the patients that are seen through there. The acute beds, um, it seems like it's an interim integrated model uh, and my concerns are that more patients would have to be transferred and this impacts on not only the patients because they're far from home but also the family and friends that would be delivering uh, essentials for the patients whether they're allowed to visit or not um, and of course this is all added uh, transport costs as well as time and the impact on families um, in the Grantham area who are already uh, upset about all the services that we've lost. Um, it seems like this is now the time for us to have our public consultation and our say and I hope that everybody does fill in the consultation and say exactly how they feel about the proposals. Um, thank you ever so much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jody, for coming in and uh, obviously raising those points with us. That's very helpful. I'm now going to hand over to our presenters, John Turner and Charlie Blythe, to present the report. And if perhaps you could cover some of what has been raised in the presentation, that'd be useful. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and good uh, morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I must say it's great to be here in person. Um, so I really, really value you accommodating me and Charlie to, to be with you this morning. Thank you. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, if I never have another Teams meeting in my life, it will be too soon. Um, uh, I, before getting on to the to the particular issue uh, uh, that's in front of the committee this morning, I also want to say that clearly uh, the work that the committee has been taking forward over the past sort of 18 months now um, uh, were really appreciative of the support that the committee's clearly demonstrated and shown to the NHS and the county. Um, it, is, it is genuinely uh, appreciated. And as I speak to you today, our, our NHS in Lincolnshire, and indeed the country as a whole, continues to be under immense pressure. Immense pressure in terms of urgent and emergency presentations, be that to our, to our GPs, our urgent treatment centres, our A&E, and our ambulance services. You know we've got a significant backlog of operations to catch up on approximately 
one in 10 of our county's population are on a waiting list for, not, for a procedure at the moment. Uh, the teams are working really hard in terms of making sure we can meet the, for example, the cancer uh, targets. You'll be aware that the vaccination programme is in full swing and we're now into COVID boosters, the 16 to 17 year olds, the 12 to 15 year olds through the school programme. And of course, the, the flu uh, vaccination campaign is now underway uh, as well. And we're all looking forward to the winter, uh, I think, if that's the right terminology, with some, some concerns uh, for, for obvious reasons. And I just wanted to, to say that uh, uh, the, the interest and the support that the committee's uh, shown uh, is as I say, very much appreciated. And we, we thank you for your uh, understanding of what the services is going through at the, at the moment through this continuing uh, terrible time. In terms of the public consultation uh, exercise, um, just, just something on the nomenclature, uh, actually. Although the exercise um, that's been going on for a few years now within the NHS, uh, uh, with the engagement of our partners, has been called the Acute Services Review, um, technically the public consultation exercise is in relation to four uh, NHS services. Uh, so you'll see that terminology being being used. Uh, so it's a it's a public consultation about four NHS services, not the, the acute services review as, as such. Um, and clearly, uh, uh, these services uh, impact potentially across the whole of the county as well. Um, so uh, we are having a county wide uh, public engagement uh, exercise. Sorry, public consultation exercise. Um, I'm, I must say I'm really, really pleased that we have started uh, this now. Uh, the committee, and I've been in front of you over the past few years, has consistently called uh, for a formal public consultation exercise to take place on these, these matters. Uh, and so I think it is a really important step forward that we've now uh, gone through all of the uh, processes internally in the NHS and with our regional and national teams uh, to seek authorisation to, to get into the public consultation exercise, which has clearly recently uh, started. Um, for um, a long number of years, there have been uh, concerns, haven't there, about the way in which some of our NHS services have been configured uh, and, and, and work. And you will know that our senior clinicians, that's our senior hospital consultants, our senior GPs, our senior uh, nurses and allied health professionals have been examining how best we can configure uh, services in Lincolnshire to provide the best quality of care, the best outcomes for patients, uh, come forward with, with ideas that are based on evidence and what we know works, uh, that reduce waiting uh, for, for patients, and also importantly, provide the best possible service structure for people working in the NHS to work within. Because clearly we want people to work in our NHS in Lincolnshire and have really uh, important, uh, worthwhile careers and enjoy their work uh, with us. Uh, as, as previously discussed at the committee, uh, there are concerns uh, that we need to retain and recruit significantly in the, in the service. Um, there have, of course, been many conversations over recent years about this as well. Uh, I very much welcome Jodie's uh, comments uh, just, just there. Um, and she'll be very familiar uh, with many of the conversations that have taken place and I know that the committee is uh, too. I would absolutely uh, encourage uh, all members of the public to engage uh, with the public consultation exercise and, and have their say. We are, we are very much uh, listening. The four services uh, that we are consulting on uh, are in relation to uh, uh, orthopaedic services, urgent and emergency care services, uh, medical bed services and stroke uh, services. And you'll be aware that three of these services are um, uh, 
uh, particularly focused around uh, Grantham Hospital, and uh, one of them uh, involves a consolidation of services currently provided across Lincoln and Pilgrim Hospital. Uh, uh, also important to note that during the pandemic, uh, some of these services uh, actually were temporarily reconfigured um, uh, along lines which are very similar to the proposals that we're now consulting on. Uh, so particularly the, the stroke services uh, uh, have been temporarily uh, consolidated in line uh, broadly with the, the uh, model uh, that the consultation is, is focused on. And you'll be aware that for some part of the pandemic, uh, uh, ULHT put a temporary 24-7 uh, UTC type arrangement in at, at Grantham. And actually, the orthopaedics uh, uh, proposal um, has been based on a pilot which we actually had in place prior to the pandemic. Uh, so we have a lot of actual experience and evidence of how these proposals uh, could work in Lincolnshire based on uh, that uh, experience over the last 18, 18 months or so. You will recall that in 2019 we had a six month public uh, engagement exercise called Healthy Conversation 2019. Um, and uh, these uh, uh, service uh, configuration issues were discussed openly uh, as part of that engagement exercise, along with other issues to do with, with service configuration in, in other services that aren't part of this uh, public consultation. Uh, and that was part of a broader conversation we had about, about the NHS and health in the county generally. Uh, that was uh, a really useful exercise. Uh, uh, we listened a lot there as well, and you'll see that in the uh, proposals that we put forward as part of this public consultation, it does include some uh, amendments uh, to, to our thinking as a result of uh, that uh, Healthy Conversation 2019. A good example is, is the confirmation uh, that our urgent treatment centre at uh, Grantham proposal would not only be 24-7, but be would be walk-in 24-7 uh, uh, as well. That was a, uh, an issue that was that was uh, uh, in, that uh, you know was was a significant point of conversation through Healthy Conversation 2019. So we've started the formal public consultation exercise. Uh, you'll note that the CCG uh, board. Uh, uh, approved uh, uh, the commencement of the exercise when it's met on the 29th of September and we actually launched the exercise on uh, the 30th of September uh, uh, and we we had a launch event with the with the media uh, which was led by our senior clinicians from across the county um, uh, it is a 12-week uh, public consultation exercise uh, so it actually uh, finishes on uh, the 23rd of December um, and there is a comprehensive uh, process of, of engagement uh, that we are taking forward. Um, you'll, uh, we have a schedule of events that take us uh, currently well into to November uh, and uh, as we learn and reflect on the early events that are taking place, We'll, we'll obviously, uh, we've got a bit of space towards the end of the public consultation exercise uh, to stand up more events uh, 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 if that is required. Uh, so yesterday uh, there was an event in Boston, uh, tomorrow uh, there's one in Grantham and on Saturday in Lincoln and there's a series of uh, virtual uh, events uh, next week. Um, Charlie will be able to describe all, all, the, all those details to you. Um, one of the points which, again, the committee has made to me over the years is, is when we do get to the consultation exercise, uh, that we should take every effort to publicise it as widely as possible across the county. Um, and I think that our, our approach does that specifically, and I can't remember which committee member it was that, that raised it on a number of occasions, uh, the importance or the, the idea, it might have been Mark, was it? It was Mark, yeah, yeah, 
to to um, uh, put a, a sort of flyer through every uh, letterbox in the in the county. So uh, uh, we've we've done that, and I hope that uh, many of you have, if not all of you, have re received that uh, now. Um, that seems to have uh, early on uh, elicited uh, a lot of uh, interest. We do have an independent body. Uh, there's something research survey. ORS, they're known as. OK, yeah. who are uh, helping us uh, with this. And they've observed that uh, 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 in all the public consultation exercises they've been familiar with, number one uh, is uh, they've never heard of an organisation putting out flyers across the whole of the population before. So that's a that was a good idea. And I'm, I'm pleased we've we've done that but also the number of responses we had in the first week. Uh, it was over 800 uh, in the first week, uh, which was the largest number that they've observed in the first week of a consultation exercise. Um, so it feels like we're off to a, to a good start uh, in terms of, of, of the engagement. Um, so uh, we're very, very much listening. Uh, you'll see uh, there's a lot of material on the website. Uh, uh, you'll see that a lot of our clinicians have, have done videos and description pieces of the of the proposals and what lies uh, behind it. Uh, you'll also observe that there's some material on the from the uh, launch last last week where the clinicians again describe the proposals and the the thinking uh, be behind it. Uh, we're very open to to feedback. Um, uh, and uh, clearly once the consultation exercise itself concludes on the 23rd of December, uh, we do have ORS, an independent organisation, helping us with the analysis and the feedback, um, uh, which will um, uh, then obviously be uh, available in the public domain. Uh, uh, our current intention is that we reach uh, a final decision, if possible, uh, by the end of March. Uh, so that will be a, a decision that the CCG board uh, would need to, to, to make. Uh, so that's the time scale that we're shooting for. Obviously, there will be a number of factors that may impact upon that time scale. So I wouldn't wish to, to make uh, give the committee the impression that that's an absolute nailed on commitment, but it certainly uh, is our current intention that if we can complete all of the analysis work and all the further consideration that will need to be given uh, as a result of the feedback, and we're able to do that in a, in a timely uh, manner, depending of course on how much feedback we get, how much analysis requires to be to be done. Uh, our, our, our hope certainly is that we'll be able to reach a final decision uh, by uh, by March next year, but obviously that um, may not actually transpire. Um, Chair, um, I'm happy to pause there. Uh, I've got Charlie with me. He'll be particularly helpful, I think, in terms of any questions about the engagement process and how we're taking that forward. And I've got my colleague Tom Diamond, who's with us virtually, uh, who's the author of uh, uh, much of the paperwork that is in front of you and other paperwork as well. So if there are any specific technical questions, uh, Tom will hopefully be able to help us uh, with, with that. So I'll, I'll pause there, Chair. Thank you, John. In which case, we'll move into the questions. I'll start with Councillor Wilson. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Chair. Good morning, John. Nice to see you. On page 42 of your report, talking about Grantham A&E, I'm a bit confused, John, because you say you're listening, yet, as you know, the campaign rally and also the petition to Down Street stretch back over five years now, and the voice is quite clear from the people of Grantham that they want an A&E, not a UTC. Uh, do you accept that the people have spoken or do you want more people to speak so that they may change their mind to a UTC? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ray. Mo mo morning. Um, yeah, we're, we're very, very aware of the petition uh, that was presented at Downing Street and the views that have been previously expressed uh, by 
people uh, in, in Grantham and the surrounding area. So that clearly is, is very much on our, our minds. Um, we're very aware of the real interest and emotional support there is for the hospital. And we, we really welcome that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really positive thing that the people of Grantham have such a, a keen interest in the hospital in their, in their town. And obviously, we all feel very strongly about the NHS uh, in the in the country and the and, and the county. So, so everybody's support is is very very much uh, uh, welcome, and feedback is is welcome. I think as as uh, we've tried to explain over a number of years, um, there have been ongoing changes at Grantham Hospital, either in the A and E department itself, but um, perhaps even more importantly. Uh, in the in the rest of the hospital itself that has led to a situation where for quite a number of years now uh, the services that have been provided by uh, the hospital that uh, work under the title of an A&E department have, been, have actually been far closer to the services that uh, would be uh, 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 described as part of an urgent treatment centre. So you'll see in the uh, in the in the material that we've we've put forward that the vast majority of people who would attend Grantham A and E department for care, uh, you know, uh, as they have done over the past number of years, the vast majority would be able to attend uh, the urgent treatment centre for for their care. Obviously, uh, uh, by making it a twenty four seven. Uh, walk-in service, that's certainly a significant change from the restricted hours service that's been in place since August 2016. Um, so um, uh, I, I, I think within the NHS, uh, our clinicians and we see this as, as a relatively minor change in terms of the services that are available. We accept and understand that the the title of the service um, has a has a has a certain sort of emotional connect for for people and for us in in the NHS uh, as as well, um, but we would hope that um, uh, the sort of how can I put it the the facts of the matter in terms of how things have been for a number of years. And what we're trying to describe here is the urgent treatment centre that we uh, envisage, uh, obviously subject to, to the public consultation exercise, will once and for all uh, put an end to, to the sort of um, uncertainty over the, the service there and will provide the people of Grantham, as well as the people working in the service in the NHS, absolute certainty about the nature of the service uh, going forward the availability of the service in the in the town and, and the surrounding uh, area. Um, so I'll I'll pause there, uh, Ray. I come back, Chairman. Um, John, I don't know if you know that about a month ago, I had an accident where I fell off a ladder cutting a, a tree and uh, ended up in Grantham A and E. I had first class service, but what surprised me was that at six thirty. When the doors were going to close, I was told you, you sit there and wait. They'll come in like swarm of bees, and they did. People just swarmed in from the outside to be seen. Uh, and I'm sure my colleagues will agree. We've all received a, a, an email today to say nobody in Grantham wants a UTC. Yet I've received many compliments about UTC that we had temporarily. So there seems to be some misinformation going on either from yourself or from the public or the campaign groups, which is the truth? Are people still using, did they use a UTC in great numbers? Uh, do you mean whilst the temporary changes? Yes, when were, it changed, were, when it became a UTC temporarily. Uh, I don't have those numbers immediately to hand, Ray. Um, I'm certainly happy to make, make them uh, available. But I think the, the it's understandable and perfectly natural behaviour, isn't it? If if somebody has a health concern that they feel needs to be seen urgently, um, and they're aware that you know, there's a time frame that they've got to get there, then then it is understandable, uh, particularly in the evenings, people come home from work or school or or, or whatever. 
that they want to have it looked at. So you can you can understand um, that that behaviour. I think that's perfectly sensible and, and, and rational. But clearly, if we move to an urgent treatment centre, we wouldn't have that sort of cut off because it would be on a twenty four seven basis. So there wouldn't there wouldn't be that anxiety for people in the in 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 the population. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the the feedback I've received is that uh, the twenty four seven uh, uh, temporary uh, uh, changes, you know, were well used on a twenty four seven basis. Clearly, uh, uh, demand, uh, you know, uh, from, from sort of midnight to six in the morning is 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 very low, un un understandably. But um, uh, I I have heard um, there were concerns about why that temporary change to make it to twenty four seven was actually re reversed back to the to the pre existing uh, arrangement. So I would interpret from that a lot of support for a twenty four seven service, and I think the evidence would show that that worked well through that temporary period for the for the people of Grantham. We can certainly look at some some the detailed numbers in terms of throughput, uh, if that would be helpful. Thank you, Councillor Orton. Dr Wookie. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, John. Um, just, um, just some general questions, really, because I think this is more of an introductory um, uh, meeting in the in respect of of, of the ASR. Um, obviously, welcome that it's actually come to consultation, having um, on behalf of Health Watch um, sat around the LSSR, the LHAC, and whatever the other reincarnations that occurred over the last five or six years for it actually to uh, uh, to be really here. And I I can't believe it is. I hope it's not going to come adrift somewhere, but um, that's excellent. Um, and one question I wanted to ask you was, um, you've chosen four of the um, main services. What is the timetable, if any, for the remaining four um, and how you were going to deal with that? The second is on page 42 of your executive document, 53 on our overall number, and that it talks about revenue consequences um, and it rather floats over that. Um, I don't know quite what the, the calculations are, but I know that they used to be roughly 10% of the, um, the 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 capital expenditure. Uh, you're going to have to allow about 10% for revenue consequences uh, after that. So um, I don't know whether you don't think you've actually done or been able or allowed to go into detail on the capital expenditure, but obviously some of these um, changes are going to require capital expenditure, particularly perhaps stroke services. So that would be quite interesting to know um, what the position is about those. So if you could answer those, that would be helpful. Thank you, Brian. Morning. Um, Morning. Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, so in terms of the, the remaining, let me start again. Uh, uh, when we started the acute services review process, uh, we actually looked at, our clinicians uh, looked at, uh, uh, I think it was 35 services across uh, the county uh, and assessed them in terms of um, sustainability, quality of care, workforce issues, uh, uh, configuration, all of those sorts of issues that you would expect uh, our senior clinicians uh, uh, to be uh, expert in and, and, and looking carefully at. Uh, as a result of the, the process, you're quite right, there were eight uh, uh, services which were identified uh, as then for the next stage of much more detailed uh, con consideration. Uh, and of those eight, uh, uh, this is just putting forward if you like, consultation relating to, to four. And the key reasons for those is that these four are priorities, either because the, the quality of care um, or the workforce issues are particularly pressing, uh, or equally 
uh, because the capital requirement to make them happen is far less than it is for the other uh, four services. So there is a small capital requirement for these four, uh, but it is relatively small compared to the uh, capital requirement for the others. And again, in, in, in round figures, um, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I think that the total capital requirement for all eight was of the order between about 50 and 60 million pounds. And for these four, I think we're looking about 10, 12 million uh, being the capital uh, requirement, uh, most of which actually is in relation to stroke. Because uh, as previously described, uh, uh, some of the other services um, in, in, uh, uh, are very close to to the current. Uh, uh, sorry, the the some of the other service proposals are quite close to what we have in in place at the at the moment. Um, so clearly, this um, government has. Um, made some step change commitments in terms of the uh, amount of capital that they want to make available uh, to the NHS, which is clearly very welcome. Um, clearly, there's the, the sort of flagship new hospital uh, programme, but there's also uh, quite a lot of other capital that is being made available to the NHS. Uh, so we we'll continue to be in very active conversation with both our regional colleagues and uh, uh, nationally in terms of uh, uh, the processes, the bids, et cetera, to try and get additional capital into the to the county, and that will will continue. So in simple terms, the the time scale for the remaining four uh, will be determined by the success or otherwise of our our bids for those uh, uh, for that additional uh, capital uh, for for these. Um, in terms of the revenue consequences of capital, uh, the figures you, you quoted are, are, are about right, Brian. Um, it, uh, it, I think it's really important to note that, uh, and, and the capital that we will uh, uh, be putting in locally, subject to the outcome of the consultation exercise, is is to be locally uh, generated in the, in, in the main. Uh, and we've got a plan and arrangement by which we can do that. Um, but but these proposals are fundamentally not about money uh, at all, really. They are about improving the quality of care, dealing with some of the urgent uh, issues that we have and ensuring that, that the services can be sustainable from a workforce point of view uh, as, as, as well. Uh, so in terms of the revenue consequences, the broad position is, you know, we, we, we will cover the uh, cost of capital and any of the other costs that, that require to be met. And, uh, but it's it's a very, uh, you know, it, it balances itself out. It's, it's not a significant cost, neither is it a, a, a saving of any significance to us either. Sorry about that. I'm going to try and get that sorted out and stopped. Thank you, Dr. Wookie. <laughs> I think everyone heard. OK, in which case I'll move on to Councillor Parkin. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think I had a very ironic experience this <clears throat> weekend where I was actually reading these um, papers in A&E and then an emergency ward at Groomsbury. I was with my daughter who, who was quite poorly over the weekend. And it was interesting reading them in, in kind of that context where you could see literally the pressures around you uh, as they were going on and, you know, all kind of seemed very, very stark and very, very yeah. real. So that was just a really, really interesting context. Um, I'm going to be a bit parochial in terms of us having talked about Grantham and, you know, Grantham does get a lot of the, the airtime quite rightly. But what I'm from Louth and so what my real concern is, and I'm, I know that Sandra would echo this for me as the East Lindsay rep, is the rurality of our of the East Lindsay. Um, and I was a little bit concerned that in when you, when you were talking about the consultation, you talked about the usual Grantham, Lincoln and all the rest of it. But there was nothing there about whether or not you're going to engage in any of the market towns like Louth, Spilsby, Alford, which are really, really important 
really important, particularly because we then have that additional confusion for residents of then going over to Grimsby for some services. And quite frankly, it isn't sometimes clear to me as a councillor when I'm advising residents how that all works, never mind to the residents themselves. And I know that for me, Lindsay, it's a really clear message is that we as a committee need have to have more influence on what's going on on those border areas as well. So please, 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 more engagement in the market towns directly and with those rural areas. Have you got a mechanism in Tulalk to engage with the parish councils? Because I was at a parish council on Monday and I know as soon as I mentioned it, they were easily pricking up and they were really wanting to know because if people in Grantham have, and I'm not, this is no, I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't issues in Grantham, but if people have issues in Grantham in travel time, try going further and further east it's even worse um so that really is a real big burning bugbear of mine is, is that yes there is ugh, i feel terrible ray i feel like i'm undermining the campaign and i'm not please just don't focus where that's going on because the needs of those people over into east lindsay and over to the case i think sometimes can be quite not ignored but muted but they're equally important. Um, and I think the other thing that we struggle with in East Lindsay, with the rurality, is that there seems to be a, and it's not a, mis it's not a mistaken assumption, but people get really hung up on terms of response times. And I don't believe that there is the understanding. And I think you've got your work cut out and helping people understand they are actually probably better having a half hour longer journey to a specialised stroke unit than just being there somewhere else as quickly as possible. And so I think the further into the rural hinterland and the further to the coast the message i think needs to that that message needs beefing up in terms of the stroke care thank you sarah some great great points just to perhaps absolutely emphasize that that the ccg's interest is all of the population across the whole of a very large county uh, our, our interest uh, is is equal for the people of gainsborough and long sutton Mablethorpe and Stamford, as it is for all points in between. That's our responsibility and our our duty. Um, I'll ask Charlie just take make a take make a few comments about what we're doing in terms of reaching out uh, yeah. market stalls and all the all the rest of it. But if I just want to take this opportunity to really emphasise uh, that whilst we're specifically consulting on these four services. We, w we will be welcoming feedback on all other aspects of the NHS as well across the county. Um, and um, uh, I know that people want to, to make comments on that. Uh, one of the specific issues we have in Lincolnshire is actually the cross border yeah. flow, if I can call it that. Uh, it's both up to, to Grimsby and Scunthorpe, uh, significantly obviously in, in patches of, of, of East Lindsay. I hope you had a great Good outcome, by the way. Your daughter did. Um, yeah, not good. No, no. It just shows the sort of pressure that yeah. the staff are under in there at the moment. But okay. But equally, of course, down in the south of the county, yeah. uh, you know, we have a very large proportion of the population there who look to, to Peterborough in the main mm. uh, for their care, and again out in the sort of in the Long Sutton area, they, they look to Kings Lane yeah. uh, for their hospital care as well. So this is very important for, for us, as, as well as the sort of west of the county. Some people look mm -hmm. to Nottingham rather than than, than, than Grantham or, or, or Lincoln. So this is very much in our, our minds. Um, and I'll pass to Charlie, if I can, just to answer your specific yeah. question about what we're doing in terms of reaching out to, to all parts of the county. Okay. Charlie? Thanks, John. Thank you. So I couldn't agree more. You know, clearly that's one of our massive sort of challenges and um, difficulties because of the rurality of the mm -hmm. county. Um, but exactly the way you've described it is one of the approaches that we're taking. So whilst it's not uploaded on the site yet, we've got market day events throughout the 12 weeks where we're going out 
sort of leafleting, flyering and raising awareness, as well as the face to face events. And then we're hosting virtual events as well to try and encourage accessibility for as many people as possible. So, for example, yesterday was our first event, whilst not in the area um, you're talking about, but in Boston, straight after the, the formal um, face to face consultation event, the engagement team were then out in the marketplace and in the town centre with exactly the same leaflets that have gone to all households in the county just to raise awareness try and start a conversation and essentially motivate people that it's not on their radar wouldn't ordinarily actually engage with a process like this um and that those people are, are, are incredibly important um you talked about LALC. So we, prior to the um, launch, um, the launch event on the 30th, which John described was essentially a media launch. Actually, prior to that, there was a huge amount of stakeholder engagement and briefing to make sure, starting with our staff across Links NHS, um, so all of our providers, commissioners and primary care, and then all of our partners, counsellors, you know, all of those people that can help us spread the message, essentially. LALC are on our database, but we do know that the breadth of that and the cascade sometimes isn't as robust as as we um as we wish it were but that needs to be bolstered throughout the next 12 weeks so a lot of the activity that the engagement team now that we've stood up more of our formal events and, and essentially kind of got that workload started and, and and bedded in those engagement um colleagues will be starting to kind of travel around so that going to those smaller groups so people you know, groups such as, um, you know, women's institute groups, mm. going to gardening Saturday clubs, men in sheds clubs, all of, again, the type of um, people across the county that we don't usually see at our engagement events and aren't usually completing our questionnaires, but we need to reach just to, mm. to give them the opportunity because our role is, from a comms and engagement perspective, is very much about what you've just described. It's about access and motivating people to become engaged, motivating them to find out so that they can make their own opinion and, and feed that back. Um, so, and, and, and again, one of that, one big element of that is you talked about the um, ambulance time and, you know, and, and the golden hour is something that we're, um, you know, we hear a lot coming back in terms of feedback. Um, Whereas actually within these four services, that thrombolysis is a four and a half hour target. But, you know, the ad campaigns that stroke associations, et cetera, have really resonated with the public um, in a really positive way. Um, but we need to make sure that people have an understanding of what that impact is will be for them as individuals. And so we need to get out to those areas to do that. And I, I really appreciate your point. We won't sadly hit every single person in the county with this with this message in the way that we would like. But um, John touched upon the kind of questionnaire responses that we've had today. And actually, as of yesterday, we'd had 1,200 responses through. Um, and just to put that into context, last year, Gloucestershire ran a very similar consultation and over their entire consultation period, they got 713 questionnaire responses. So we do know things such as the door drop leaflets, um, such as pushing out the website, the, the press in the county have been brilliant. You know, the campaign groups have been pushing this out as well. So using partners, the LRF structure and all of those um, bodies and organisations that can help us reach these, these people that ordinarily, as you quite rightly point out, we wouldn't, is how we're going to keep those numbers kind of ticking in and, and getting that response. And then just one final um, point to make, which is more associated actually with Councillor Wharton's question in the in the first instance. And, and um, I, I totally appreciate you're aware of this, Councillor Wharton, but um, we talk about that quantity of response. And we do want to see as many people respond as possible to, to this questionnaire. But it's really important in terms of making sure that the public are aware that a consultation isn't measured in terms of quantity. So for example, a thousand we support and 900 we don't support wouldn't wouldn't create a result that those proposals um, go through or, or, or the counter. What it's about is one piece of feedback, one questionnaire response that comes through that, that um, highlights maybe um, a, a suggestion that hasn't been factored in, a piece of evidence that needs to be considered that could change the course of that service review proposal to date, propose, um, process to date, that's where the difference will come in. So it's really important that the public are aware that it's not a kind of, you know, it's, it's not a barometer on the front of a supermarket type process. It's much more about that quality of, of information. And that's why we really want to make sure people are briefed, these clinician films, all of that content that we keep uploading through FAQs on our sites and, and sharing through the engagement events is really important because it may trigger a really important and valuable and, and um, impactful piece of feedback for us. 
Yeah, you may come back. Just a real, just further more, because the, 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 I just want to check. Are you there? Do, do you have the capacity then to go and do the engagement with individual parish councils in their meetings? So uh, we've got a really dedicated focused team on this. So I can't promise that we have enough people to get out to every parish council, but certainly to date and our intention is that as we get interest and people wanting representation, we're going we're trying to facilitate that. Sarah, try and remember to put your mic on. Sorry, I'm normally shouting loud enough. <laughs> um, could you then give us the details so that we can then pass that forwards absolutely. to our parishes that'd be really helpful thank yeah, you yeah absolutely thank you council park it's only because it's recorded as well so it's picked up so that's all thank you uh, just if i may come in and build on where councillor parkins just came from quite clearly at the moment in time we've got an emerging humber acute services review and this will have a potential impact on those residents on the east coast of the county and east lindsay there may also be some similar changes at other neighboring trusts have these potential changes in other areas been taken into consideration with the planned Lincolnshire changes and the possible additional pressures on our own Lincolnshire trusts as they pull away from Princess Diana and Grimsby and so on? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the simple answer is yes. As, as you'd expect, we, we, we do link very closely with colleagues out of county. Um, the CCG's responsibilities are actually to the population of Lincolnshire wherever they happen to seek their healthcare, rather than just sort of for services that are located within within our within our county. Uh, so there is the sort of regular dialogue uh, across all of the borders, uh, actually. So, um, you know, for for example, we are aware that in the sort of uh, I think called hum Humber and Vale uh, area, which includes the the two north uh, the uh, the two council areas just to the to the north of us, south of the Humber. Uh, they are uh, uh, taking an acute services review process for themselves. And equally in the south of the county, uh, we've had very close uh, working relationships with uh, particularly uh, NWAF to run uh, Peterborough, Stamford and, and Hinchinbrook hospitals, uh, uh, specifically because um, some of the, the changes will have an impact on, on their service planning as well. So it's not just what they're doing that may impact on the care and the and the access to it for people in Lincolnshire, it's also the other way the other way around as well. So that is a that is a constant uh, part of the part of the process. So I'm very happy to to reassure the committee that we're we're, we're very cited on uh, uh, those those particular issues. But generally, of course, um, change is continuously happening within the NHS as uh, as uh, all sorts of pressures, new clinical evidence, new ways of working, new demands uh, uh, come, come upon us. So this is part of a, an ongoing sort of process of dialogue uh, with our neighbours as well as within the, the county itself. Thank you, John. Councillor Whittington. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deed, Mr. Chairman. I've got several questions, but they are but they're fairly short. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, but the first thing, uh, thanks, thanks, John, thanks, Charlie. For the presentation, for the presentation, answering the questions. First of all, a big thank you for the flyers going out to every house. I think that's really positive, and uh, I know I was nagging you and banging on about it, but I, I think actually the proof has actually been that the you know responses that's been elicited so far, which which seems to be very good. I'm just wondering, Mr. Chairman, if it'd be possible, uh, John, if you could keep the committee updated with the numbers on that. I mean, I I, I appreciate the point you said. It's not about quantity, but about quality. But it would be interesting just to know how far into the community and, and some responses responses you've actually got my first question is actually on um the the events because I, I i i'm registered to attend the one in grantham tomorrow evening and i did that online but the only way i could find to register for that was online it is is that the only way because my concern would be that potentially could exclude the, the those that, that, that uh, I, I don't know if we could still use the phrase hard to reach but I'm thinking about those people who haven't got access to a digital uh, means. So you know, the, the people who can't afford it, the elderly, to make sure they've not been disenfranchised. A second point is around, because um, you mentioned, John, and you alluded to in your 
presentation. Obviously, during COVID, a lot of the sort of change, some of the changes kind of happened because of just the way of dealing with COVID. So the question is, how far, are, I mean, presumably you are moving towards this model. So how far advanced are you in terms of that? Because I think that ties into my other question that I was going to raise of, because you refer to the fact that the final decision, hopefully by the board of the CCG will be in March, just around how far advanced you are, when do you think, if, if, if your timetable goes to plan, when we'll actually see these changes implemented? So I think those two questions I've got a kind of related to each other. My third one is, is fairly short. We really welcome the, the Orthopaedic Centre of Excellence at Grantham. But is that going to be both overnight and day case? Because because you, you referred to the day case at Louth. I'm just wondering if Grantham will have will have day cases as well. Um, my next question is, is on the acute beds at Grantham and District. Uh, and sort of the change from the current model to the new one. What how will that impact the, the residents the residents of Grantham and the, the neighbouring area they use there? Because at the moment, obviously, so certainly when my when my mum was in Grantham Hospital, that maybe most of the the patients on the on those wards tended to be fairly elderly people. I'm just obviously concerned with the elderly potentially having to having to travel the the impact it, it has on them. Um, and I think then my I think, to be honest, that's it. But actually, just really, really pleased that the walking, the walking, the the, the twenty four seven you just see is going to be walking because I think for a lot of people in Grantham that was obviously, you know, I, I think we would like a fully fledged A and E, but I think because of the staffing problems that we've got, and it's it's probably you know, um, so so I'm really pleased on that. And I guess my final point is. And this thing is just a general point, not just about A&E, but about all services. You know, we're aware that there are problems with recruitment and retention in Lincolnshire. What what measures are the CCG and the, and the trusts in Lincolnshire doing around that? Obviously, we've got the medical school in place. So in the medium to long term, that hopefully should address some of those. Maybe have to actually train and retain our own. But, but just what we're trying to do to kind of make sure that we do try and find ways of recruiting and retaining staff in Lincolnshire. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for your comments and your, your, your appreciation. And um, uh, yes, uh, the flyers, um, uh, great, great idea. And it's obviously, it's been, uh, you know, that's been, been, been vindicated. Very happy to keep the committee updated on progress with the with the engagement uh, campaign, uh, the numbers, the feedback. Um, you know, as that that comes through clearly, it's only going to be after the twenty third of December that we'll see the the full picture. But I'm happy to be guided by by the committee in terms of what information, uh, without offering too much of a running commentary, but. Uh, as we go through what what information the committee would find helpful that's that's not a problem uh, uh, at all uh, you you asked about how far advanced were the changes through through the, through the pandemic uh, when when we implemented them um, obviously the the uh, the orthopedic changes were part of a pilot prior to the pandemic uh, so so the answer actually is that 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 pilot is is essentially what the the proposal is uh, so the uh, the the, uh, the the proposal is almost we just consolidate as a permanent model uh, the pilot that has been in place for um, a number of years uh, now. Actually, that that pilot was slightly stood down a bit during the during the pandemic, but um, had had really good traction part prior to the pandemic. In terms of the stroke changes, uh, clearly the the, the um, uh, uh, consolidation at Lincoln County on a temporary basis is still uh, in place. Um, I would say it's it's very it's pretty far advanced in terms of towards uh, uh, the proposal, uh, but there are some differences in relation uh, to it. Um, uh, but um, it, it's it's a long way down that 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 track, and we've obviously clearly. Uh, discussed the urgent treatment centre changes that were ULHT put in place on a temporary basis already. So I think for those three, there's there's really good evidence and experience that we can we can draw on. 
uh, and, and, and we are doing orthopedics. My understanding is yes, overnight and uh, day cases as, 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 as well. Uh, but we'll just make sure we double check on on that. But that is my very clear uh, under, understanding. Uh, in terms of the, the acute medical beds, uh, I think the real um, shift that we're trying to, to uh, uh, affect here is to really take an integrated approach for frail elderly people um, uh, and to sort of manage their care in a joined up way between their, their home circumstances and their hospital care as well. At the moment, that isn't as integrated as we would, would wish it uh, to be. Um, so, so we're not proposing, for example, to you know, any significant reductions in the number of beds. It's actually about how the model uh, that the beds will will, will, will use. Um, when we um, presented this, or just how senior clinicians presented this to the uh, Regional Clinical Senate, uh, it was met with sort of universal uh, praise, really, in terms of how transformational it could be for frail elderly patients. And I hope actually is that uh, if, uh, as we intend, this this is a success, it's a model that we could develop uh, potentially in, in Lincoln County and Pilgrim as well in relation to some, not all, uh, but some of their their acute medical bed services. Um, on recruitment and retention, um, that is a sort of specialist subject all of itself, which um, uh, uh, I, I'm no specific expert uh, on, but that might be an issue that the committee wanted to, to, to look at and, and hear from our, our people who are leading on our, our people plan. But you're quite right, the medical school is, is a great fillet for, for the NHS and the county, uh, and the sort of trainees are uh, you know pretty much embedded now, as they should be uh, in, in, in general practice and, and hospital services. Uh, Dr. Sharrock here from, from the local medical committee, he'll be able to talk to you about what we're doing in terms of recruitment and retention and, and GPs. I think it's fair to say that we, um, uh, we are concerned about matters in the short term, but the medium to longer term prospects uh, look uh, more positive than they have done for, for a while. We have recruited significantly in primary care over the last 18 months or so as well. Uh, so things like physiotherapists, pharmacists, um, as well as social prescribers working in, in, in primary care. And that has gone uh, quite, quite well, uh, I must say. And um, we have had a big push over the past 18 months on health and care support workers. Um, so you, you probably don't know, but we had significant vacancies in health and care support workers, particularly in our, our acute hospital services. We had a really strong push on that and, and essentially filled virtually all of those. And those tend to be people uh, from, from Lincolnshire stepping into, into those roles. Uh, and, and separate but sort of related is we have invested nearly a million pounds in the uh, 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 education facilities out at Pilgrim at, at Boston as well. And there are a number of uh, courses that are now starting to take place um, uh, particularly focused on East Coast uh, recruitment uh, as well, uh, because we feel, you know, that's a really important part of our, our sort of grow your own uh, strategy. So those are some of the headlines from from that. But again, we 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 have uh, experts within the the NHS who are leading on this work day in day out for us. Uh, so we have our own sort of people plan. It's called. And that's part of every system is required to have it as part of the, the national people plan uh, approach. Oh, I need to come back if it's quick, Councillor Wenting. Very quickly. Uh, John, thanks, th thanks, thanks for the answer, John. Really pleased actually with, with, with the model you were describing for the um, integrated model of Grantham for the medical beds and the around the elderly, because certainly when my mum was sort of, and, and quite a few people like her, they tend to yo yo between home and into hospital then back at home and I was this sort of situation where there were social workers in hospital social workers out in the community and there was it's just it was and it was affecting an awful lot of other people as well and so any way to kind of integrate that between the health service and 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 
plus a county council around adult social care, I think it would be great because I, I, at the moment, because certainly the experience that I, we, I went through with my mum was this, this is yo-yo and this bounce effect. And uh, if, if you can get a proper in, in integrated model between all the agencies, I think that would be a really positive step forward for literature. Thanks, thanks, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That's, that's really great feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whittington. I've now got Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, John. Um, I'm aware this is only the launch of a consultation, um, and but there are extensive details about options and things like that. But I could find no mention of the outsourced elective orthopaedic surgery, which is carried out at Barbara, um, which is rated very highly uh, by local residents um, who've been treated there. Um, is this something that uh, uh, will be impacted by the uh, the proposals? Thank you. That's great. Great question. Um, uh, clearly, if we set up this centre of excellence in in Grantham, uh, and if we continue to to have that model based on the the pilot, um, uh, uh, we will, I think, continue to 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 have that option available for people in Lincolnshire as a much more attractive uh, proposition uh, than certainly orthopaedic surgery might have been a couple of years ago. So you'll be aware, for example, uh, that we did have uh, significant problems in terms of cancelling patients' operations, um, some uh, on the day and some patients more than once. Uh, I, I myself, you know, uh, know somebody who's, who's sort of been subject to that and and the emotional trauma it causes for them and their families is is significant so so one of the things that the pilot has demonstrated is is uh, uh, virtually no uh, cancellations uh, which is just just brilliant uh, so it is about um, uh, 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 having much more confidence in this in the orthopedic services uh, through the through the, through the model uh, clearly uh, uh, people are currently free to choose where they they go for their surgery and many people in Lincolnshire currently choose to go both out of county and to the private sector out of county and that's something that is is on the CCG in terms of um, uh, paying for that uh, people will always be able to to, to do that unless government changes its, its policy. But, but very clearly what we want to do is to uh, encourage more people to, to have their orthopaedic surgery in the county, provided by uh, brilliant orthopaedic teams, uh, both uh, at Grantham and at Louth. Um, uh, uh, and uh, for our patients to get their, their procedures as quickly as possible, uh, and uh, to be confident that they won't be cancelled uh, closer to the, to the time. So, so this is a really sort of positive, I think, dynamic step up in terms of the offer on orthopaedic surgery. Uh, and um, I, I think it now has become established as a, as a real choice that, that people in Lincolnshire have. So um, there will always be uh, uh, the independent sector actually playing a really key role uh, uh, as, as part of the, if you like, the, the wider NHS offer. Um, uh, and obviously people in Lincolnshire, uh, whether it's the NHS or the independent sector, do go out of county uh, uh, anyway. And over the next couple of years, the real push is going to be on actually getting down the, the, the elective waiting list, almost regardless of where where patients get their, their, their treatment, um, such as the, the length of the waiting lists uh, now. But I, I, I would hope that once we've kind of got that into a better position, uh, this sort of brilliant orthopaedic uh, uh, service that's, that's, that's so evident now in Grantham will become um, something that people in Lincolnshire even more want to access their care from. Thank you. Councillor Woodliffe. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. I uh, apologise, first of all, by being, being late this morning. Uh, you put it down to the Lincolnshire tract uh, issue of um, rurality, I think is the word, actually. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, well, good morning, John. Um, first of all, thank you very much for attending um, the committee meeting at Boston on Thursday, 16th of September for our CNC meeting. Um, 
you were presenting a list of questions, not all were answered. Is there any possibility of written answers for those questions that weren't an weren't answered at the meeting? I think it would be greatly appreciated by the members. Yeah. Um, questions from other members that come to me, because that's what happens. Um, one member asked me, um, I would be obliged if at Health Scrutiny could ask if they're going to make the results of the survey public and how can the results be assessed if they do so? That's one member's question to me. And um, another one um, really concerns about, um, I suppose, um, I'm fearful that it might be all too easy to concentrate everything in Lincoln. That's a problem. We are a very rural county, as you know, and people who live in Boston, well, the transport links are terrible, you know, pretty well. And then there's those tractors which keep getting in the way. <laughs> Not well, we care about that really, but that's that's the situation, isn't it? Um, and the other thing is, of course, I noticed that um, on page 52 of the report, um, looking at the financial case, of course, um, the financial impact of the ACR brings a, is it a saving about three million, isn't it? Essentially, what it's about is that the prime driving force here. You know, with patient care is key, obviously, but um, is uh, the financial benefit of this the driving force? And we know that um, the the ULHT runs a or has run a deficit of 100 million, isn't it? Thereabouts. Of course, COVID sorted that out, isn't it? Really, the government's generosity. You know, Boris dug deep into his pockets and poured out 100 million for you, or perhaps not quite so much. But um, um, obviously, um, we appreciate that the, uh, you know, the hospital services require, you know, more money than they receive. Is this a step in that direction? I suppose. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you know, well, I represent Boston. Boston people are just very nervous. Um, you know, there's a lot of investment in Pilgrim Hospital, but you know, it will be so easy to transfer quietly so many of the services that people have in Boston off to Lincoln or anywhere else I suspect the chairman may be concerned about that um, you know Skegness not too far away from us also equally isolated as we are large number of people go to Skegness in the summer and with these staycations holidays now even more people are pouring over to Skegness <clears throat> to benefit obviously the um, shops and services at Skegness but we won't mention that, but um, nevertheless, there will be more need for medical services in this area. So the fact that the population changes, you know, is something that needs to be taken into account. And um, I suppose really that's that's primarily it. Um, obviously, I, I accept that we have to save money. I mean, I'm not a fool. I understand that um, the, the economy is under pressure and the health service has to justify every single penny it spends. And of course, in the end, you know, there may be things that have to change that we don't like. But nevertheless, um, I'm here to represent the people of Boston, and they've sell, tell, told me that um, what to tell you. Yeah. So questions we want answers to, please, and um, the other things I've mentioned, if that's possible. Thank you very much, Chairman, for allowing me to speak. Thanks, Stephen. Morning. Um, firstly, uh, thanks for. Uh, having myself and, and colleagues at the at the council meeting a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, I, I learned a lot from that conversation. I think we were together for two and a half hours, um, so uh, uh, that was that that was um, uh, valuable for me. Thank you. Um, in in terms of any of the questions that we have didn't answer on on the evening, more than happy to to to, to respond to those. I think Andy was just going to confirm which of the ones that um, uh, 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 we, we need to get an answer back on. I understand so, but, but that. Very, yes. very happy I understand to, what you can and cannot answer, yeah. right? I'm not expecting you to you know, you know, but, be confidential. I mean, what, answer what you can, what you can't answer, please just say. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. So, so Sorry, Chairman. any of the outstanding and, uh, questions from that evening, very happy to, to, to look at. In terms of the, the other questions you've, you've raised, thank you, Stephen. Uh, uh, firstly, yes, the results of the survey, very happy to share uh, uh, very openly how, how that is, is going. I did just say earlier, very happy to keep the, the, the committee appraised of, of, of that. And uh, we spoke just earlier in the meeting about the, the number of responses that we already uh, received. Uh, and you may be aware that uh, uh, the first uh, sort of uh, public meeting on this, we actually took place in Boston uh, yesterday. Um, uh, uh, this isn't about money at all. Um, 
as I say, there's, there is a marginal saving there. Uh, but I, I, I think when you look at the overall challenge we've got, it's, it, it's, it'll level itself out, uh, 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 I think, very, very easily. So money is not the driving force. The driving force is about quality of care, making sure the services are configured in the right way so that our clinicians can provide the best outcomes for, for, for patients, reducing waiting and um, actually creating services that our workforce will enjoy their careers and working in so we retain these people in the in the county. I think one of the key things, in fact the overriding thing I did pick up um, on that evening meeting was um, the concerns for you know the the role and the future and the commitment uh, of Pilgrim Hospital and uh, very clearly uh, you and colleagues at the council made some some excellent points in in, in relation to this. Uh, I, I, so I've, I've actually researched what it is that we've actually spent uh, and, and developed in Pilgrim Hospital over the past couple of years and what we're committed to going, going forward. So just to give you a, a, a flavour of this, because I think that this just underpins, whilst it'll always be service changes, and we understand the pressures that we're under, the absolute commitment that we have uh, to, to Pilgrim Hospital and its role in the NHS in Lincolnshire and specifically for the east of the counties is, is, is absolute. So in the past couple of years, we spent nearly eight million pounds on the fire infrastructure, over five million on new medical equipment, nearly two million on reconfiguration of the hospital and refurbishment of the wards. As I said earlier, we spent nearly a million pounds on the education facilities at the hospital uh, to completely refurbish them and then attract clinicians, nurses, allied health professionals into the area. And that's also part of our sort of grow your own uh, initiative as well. We've spent over seven million pounds on enhancements to urgent and emergency care, including the obviously the new sort of urgent treatment centre there. And you'll be aware of the commitment to, to the uh, uh, completely new A&E uh, department at, at Pilgrim. Uh, uh, which will be the value, which will mean it's the biggest single investment by ULHT in, or by us and ULHT together, actually, in in any single program in the in 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 our hospitals. So, hopefully that, and I'm happy to provide you uh, with more details about about that, Stephen. Um, but I think that just hopefully sort of underpins the commitment that there is to to Pilgrim. And you'll also be aware that vascular services are currently sort of run out of Pilgrim uh, 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 as part of a countywide offer. And uh, we envisage that will continue for, for, for many years uh, to come. And we'll also have invested or are investing in, in other parts of the, the estate and the service in the, in the east. Uh, so we know, for example, at Skegness Hospital, uh, there's the urgent treatment centre, uh, which has now been stood up uh, earlier in the in the year, uh, and uh, the community trust have got a nearly nearly two million pounds sort of refer program uh, uh, for Skegness uh, in, on track to deliver a range of sort of benefits as well. Uh, so I'm um, sorry if I've been a bit comprehensive there, but 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 there are. I just really wanted to emphasize to the committee and obviously to you on behalf of the, the people of, of Boston uh, that we have heard the the concerns from the people of, of Boston and the surrounding area over the years. We understand those concerns. Clearly geography, transport issues are a challenge. That's just, just Lincolnshire. But our commitment to the hospital uh, and to the East Coast is as absolute as it is to any other part of the of the county. Thank you. Very briefly, Councillor Woodley. Yes, it just uh, you'll make one point. I agree with everything that you've said. I'm very pleased to see the support for the Pilgrim Hospital. Um, and what you're doing here, this survey, this survey is a very important step forward in communication. <laughs> but it is communication. The biggest issue that comes to me through members and through residents is communication inside the service itself. It's communication between patients and um, doctors and so on, 
and inside the surface, I have some. I have a letter in front of me which I can't read out, which is actually from a, a Labour a Labour councillor actually, who condemns the lack of communication that he's ex currently experiencing while he waits for a very major operation, and it's communication is that something you've really got to work at. Everything else is fine, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, but communication, you're making a major step forward with this survey and the way you're going about it is great. Do it inside the service, do it inside as well, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. I'm just conscious of the time now and I think everyone's had some very valid questions. I have four more speakers, but what I will say is I am going to propose later on that we do form a working group to do an in-depth dive into each of these subjects. So we'll be able to ask many more questions in that way than what we can achieve this morning. So just to make that clear to yourselves, I'll now invite in Councillor Harrison, please. Thank you, Chairman. Morning, John. Um, just minor quite quick short questions actually um the first one could you explain if east lindsay patients go to grantham for their orthopedic services would they have to go back there for their follow-up appointments or would arrangements be made for them be seen perhaps hopefully at loud is it something you could look at and also there's only brief mention to louth at all in the papers it'd be really helpful for myself and for residents that ask me what are the current services at louth and will there be any changes um i'm quite satisfied to get that in writing thank you very much but i think it would be helpful because louth hospital always comes up in our committee and the other one on all of them you do mention um community care at the end of your tables but uh, i'm concerned about that, that particularly in relation to stroke how is it visualized that they will come back for earlier release to have care locally i would like to understand that please because i think that's really important thank you Uh, thank, thank you. In, in terms of uh, the follow-up to, to orthopaedics, I'd need to go away and check that. Uh, but my, my understanding is that uh, wh where anything is required, that will be done either virtually or locally, wherever it is possible to to, to do so. Um, uh, uh, yes, I'm, I'm I'm happy to provide some information about the current services at, at Louth, um, and I'll need to do that obviously with. The community trust who, who who run many of the services there, ULHT obviously for as they have services there uh, too. Um, so if you give me the opportunity to to do that, I'll be very happy to. Um, stroke care and rehabilitation. Um, uh, that might be something that if there's a deeper dive look at, is is something that should should come up. But the all of the evidence is that after you've had your hyperacute and your acute uh, stroke care and you're into the rehabilitation phase that is undoubtedly best done in your own home with the support of the physiotherapist the occupational therapist and others who are expert in in the rehabilitation uh, process um, so uh, again that's something we can look at in 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 detail uh, in, uh, uh, clearly, that community, I mean, at the moment, we have, what, between 11, 1,200 strokes in the county uh, a year. Uh, I mean, that's a significant number. So there's already uh, uh, a huge amount of expertise that we have in our NHS in relation to stroke uh, rehabilitation and, and, and community. And I'm very happy just to crystallise for you in writing again, you know, how it works at the moment and what the additional enhancements uh, may be in relation to that. Thank you. Thank you for the responses. But in relation to the last thing, once again, rurality um, for people who are at home and, you know, the level of staff required to move around in a rural area. I think that is really important. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Councillor Harrison. OK, Councillor Allen next, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
a lot of the questions I was going to ask have been raised. I'm not totally sure they've all been answered fully. Um, um, and I, I just got a, a a number of observations, I think, to make that might require some elucidation, if at all possible, or just taking away. Um, I, I should point out that I'm fairly new to this committee as well, so some of my questions might seem amateurish. Um, if, to, if that is the case, please excuse me or please tell me so. Um, it seems to me that um, consolidation of services and specialisms is probably um, got some benefits. Um, I was pleased to hear your comments about it. Um, it's not nothing to do with money, it's to do with service provision. And I, I can see some elements of that in terms of some of the responses that you made to other committee members when they raised questions. Um, although um, I think there is an underlying concern, shall we say, that um, um, in some cases, from experience, um, a lot of it may well be to do with um, money. Um, and um, whilst you said, um, you know, the savings are nothing to do with it, um, I'm quite sure that um, um, cost effectiveness um, is something that um, would apply to any business and it would apply to the NHS as well. We don't expect you to waste money either. Um, so, so, so there is an issue there, I think. Um, I think one of the difficulties that there is with this sort of with um, consolidation and specialism, um, particularly when it moves away from the local area, is a great deal of concern um, about that, which is really what sat behind a lot of the issues at Grantham and still sit behind them from what I from what I hear. Uh, and some of that to do with, is to do with travelling, and some of that is to do with um, the National Health Service moving costs from consultants moving in the other direction to the public moving, you know, to the specialist area. Um, and of course, that's got savings for the NHS, which you know shouldn't be ignored, but it has got costs to the public in terms of then uh, moving in the other direction. Um, but. I think part of the problem is then that people have got to have a good experience of those specialist um, locations and those specialist areas. Um, and when they go to them, they, they should see that there, it is beneficial for them to actually um, take part in these improvements that the NHS is, is promoting. Um, and that isn't always the case. You go to these specialist areas and um, you queue and you um, um, uh, do multiple things, you know, in one visit that could have been done in a lot more efficient and effective way. And people think, well, this isn't the service that I would have got locally or this isn't the service that I did get locally. And I think that is part of the problem. Now, um, it's, it seems to me that if you are consolidating services because you do have um, recruitment issues and um, and uh, manning issues, um, simply moving everybody to one location, then it's just moving the problem to one location. So it's not surprising then that you need big waiting rooms and so on. Um, although um, some of the estates don't seem to, to don't seem to be enlarged to cope with this influx of people that are coming from all over the county from different locations. Um, and um, you know, I have been into Lincoln at, at, at times and not been able to sit because the waiting room was just not big enough. Um, so so. Communication, I think, is one of the things, and that was raised <coughs> by uh, one of the committee members, um, that um, the message has to be given out and the benefits of what you're promoting have to be shown to be quite clearly, but they have to be there in practice as well. Otherwise, people won't believe the word it is that you're almost saying. Um, and your list of expenditure was very, very, very good. And I'm very pleased to see that all this expenditure is taking place in Lincolnshire. Um, and it's good to see that all this extra money that's been given to the National Health Service is actually appearing on the ground and not just disappearing. So thank you very much. OK, th thanks for the comments and the, and, and the questions. Um, in terms of uh, what I observe in, in the NHS is is we are continuously uh, sort of reconfiguring the way in which services are work, uh, determined by a number of factors to do with patient demand, to do with clinical evidence, uh, to do with meeting workforce challenges, to do with health inequalities, you know, a, a, a whole range of factors 
influence, a, a continuous sort of flow uh, in terms of how we, we, we need to, 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 to respond. Um, so whilst we're talking here about consolidating stroke services, uh, there are many other services which actually are going in the other direction out into to local communities, into primary care. Um, and um, I know the top to Dr. Sharrock, Kieran, you're here somewhere. Yeah, uh, would would uh, would we'll probably tell you about how much more work GPs in in primary care are, are, are taking on uh, as well. So um, uh, there is that continuous sort of sort of change. So I, I think you're spot on. People, um, you know, need to to um, see the benefits for them of any changes. Uh, so. It's probably about 10 or so years ago now uh, that cardiology uh, uh, services were consolidated in Lincoln. Uh, we have the heart centre uh, that operates out of the uh, county hospital. It actually delivers outcomes which are right up there amongst the best in the country. Uh, there's uh, brilliant patient care uh, that is, is delivered there. And in terms of health benefit, uh, whilst everybody um, goes to that service, gets a great, great service. Actually, in terms of improving lives, uh, it is uh, people from the East Coast area of the county who are receiving the most significant benefit in terms of, of outcomes for their, their health. Uh, so I think that's a great example of here in Lincolnshire. Uh, you know, we've already done it and we've demonstrated it. And again, with the, the stroke services, which have been temporarily because of pandemic uh, consolidated at Lincoln, uh, the uh, clinical audit is demonstrating better outcomes uh, for patients. So in, in, it comes back to, I think, Sarah, you, you said, you know, um, uh, uh, if we're asking people to travel further, there has to be a real benefit for them in terms of their, their health. There's there, there's no point in having a service local that's local on your doorstep if actually they're not just structured in a way that gives the best care and delivers the best outcome for you. And I'm sure, again, if you're having a deeper dive into this, uh, our stroke specialists will be able to unpack what the benefits are um, uh, for stroke patients and also for people working in the in the service. My understanding is at the moment we have uh, eight uh, stroke specialist consultant posts in the county. Actually, only two of them are staffed on a permanent basis at the moment. So the others are a, a range of sort of locum agency and, and, and vacancies. Uh, and when you hear them talk about the recruitment efforts they've made, uh, they find it very, very difficult to recruit because we haven't actually set up the service model in a way which is attractive for others to come and work with us and them here in here in the, the county. Um, uh, the point about communication, I think, is spot on. Stephen made that earlier uh, as well. Uh, and I, I do think that that is a, you know, a, a, a constant challenge for us in, in the NHS, where over 10,000 people uh, receive NHS care in the county every day. So clearly communicating between services, between services and patients uh, is, is you know, a fundamental sort of oil that needs to keep the, the, the wheels uh, moving with that. And we don't always get it right. It is evident that we don't always get it, get it right. Uh, I shall pause there. Can I can make Very a quick comment, back. please, Councillor Allen? Um, uh, I was congratulating, well, I was suggesting that there was a good message to send out, um, such as Steve um, mentioned. Um, um, if you're talking about communication within the, within the Act, National Health Service, I think that is, um, there's vast rooms for improvement in that, and I can give you some practical evidence of that, um, in that my wife's consultant in the Nottingham Hospital had to tick off Lincoln because they stopped uh, taking the drugs that he'd prescribed. So that's not a very good example of good communication. Um, and in terms of primary care, I, I think you know primary care has got a very important part to play in all this, um, both um, um, both at the uh, start of um, um, start of uh, 
any health issues as well as um, you know after um, interventions taking place perhaps um, and we, indeed we've got something coming up in terms of um, um, that sort of thing with the additional staff that's been going into primary care although the case history I don't think is a particularly good one and it strikes me as being um, illustrative of the whole issue of why it doesn't work particularly well but we'll deal with that when we get to that article um, so um, I think the other thing is, yes, you know, pick the good one, you know, strokes. Um, but perhaps what we need to, who we need to talk to, is the ones that's the one is at the bottom of the list rather than the top of the list. Very good, but that's where we ought to be going, and we need to look at, you know, um, the whole range of things. I think and see, you know, what is at the bottom of the list and why it's at the bottom of the list, and what examples, you know, what good practice and lessons learned and all the rest of it can be put into there from from your top rated specialisms. Hey, thank you. Uh, Councillor Matthews, I understand you'd like to come in. I will apologise, I can't actually see when you make the requests with this hybrid system. It doesn't come up on my screen, so I had to sort of wait until I've had a message from Simon to let me know. So please come in now. Thank you, and I'd like to apologise. I'm on the uh, B6403 Heath Lane, nearly at Grantham. It's taken me an hour and 40 minutes to drive from Sutton-on-Sea to my meeting in, uh, in Grantham, which begins at 11.30. So I'm my question, John, is um, I was at a seminar where Chris Whitty spoke about health in coastal communities, following up his uh, annual report on health in coastal communities. He's done an amazing amount of research, and indeed there are case studies in there from um, Lincolnshire County Council Public Health, Andy Fox. I want to absolutely be sure that you're not going to repeat that exercise of consultation where the facts are known about deprivation, about Morality about or has all the things that have come up today have been identified by the chief medical officer who is calling for a national strategy. So here's an opportunity for your organisation to lead the way in a national strategy by putting health back where it's required. Um, it, I, I was a little bit disappointed when you said morality. Well, that's just Lincolnshire. I'll tell you the human reaction. Uh, I have constituents who are, who attend um, a Hope House in Maywellthorpe. Uh, they've been called to breast screening and they've been called to a mobile breast screening unit in Boston or in Louth and they can't get there because there's no buses and they can't get back even if they took the bus and they don't have a car. They're just saying, well, I won't bother. Now, that to me is shocking. Diabetes, mobile screening units placed in Louth, not placed in uh, the East Coast. So it seems like some of the, some of the, the care you're expressing is a little bit wearing your heart on your sleeve. The actions are not matching the expressed concern. So, so first of all, I, you only really say yes. Please, are you going to take a significant amount of attention of Chris Whitty's report, Health and Coastal Communities? And please, will you engage with Andy Fox from Lincolnshire County Council and get his evidence about the sparsity of provision of, of, of health in Nashville, and then take that into account in your consultation? Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. I mean, the answer, the answer is yes, and, and yes. And just to, just, just to uh, sort of underline the, the point that the CCG and the County Council work very closely together, obviously on all, all matters, but specifically Derek Ward, the Director of Public Health, and I um, sort of co-sponsor a health and equalities uh, 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 programme which is jointly led by Andy Fox and one of my members of staff, Sandra, Sandra Williamson, um, which isn't exclusive to the East Coast because clearly health inequalities are experienced across the across the county. Uh, but it does have a a uh, very, very close eye on on the East Coast uh, issues. So just to confirm that the you know, we are working very closely with public health on it. Um, uh, Derek Ward and I actually met with Chris Whitty when he came to visit uh, Lincolnshire shortly before uh, the pandemic started, uh, and it was it was great to be able to spend some time with him. Um, he, I think, undoubtedly really gets the issue about coastal communities, and I think it's quite um, um, uh, significant that his recent report was focused on coastal communities rather than uh, other issues. Um, so I can just reiterate that I think Lincolnshire is, is very much sort of in there with, with Chris Whitty uh, on, on this issue. 
clearly uh, working together with the county council we're trying to be very strong advocates for the county as a whole and certainly our east coast in in particular i will continue on that i'll also commit to look at the issues about the the mobile breast screening and diabetes screening unit that uh, councillor matthews raised us as well thank you chair thank you Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wotton, I'll allow you to come back very quickly. You said you've got yeah, Thank you very much, Steve Chairman. Uh, John, just a quick question on page 43 or 32 of your report. It's talking about UTC. It says, if a patient goes to proposed UTC and needs to be removed to an alternative hospital site, tra travel arrangements will be made. Now, on the UTC criteria, patients shouldn't be going to UTC with serious or urgent needs. So could you just clarify why somebody might be going there? Thank you. Yeah, abs absolutely, Ray. So so um, clearly for, for most people who experience an emergency condition, um, nearly all people would call 999, wouldn't they? Um, or potentially 111 and then... Uh, uh, puts them through to, to, to 999 uh, and then the ambulance clearly will then transport the patient to, to the nearest centre that can meet their, their uh, presenting needs. There will be a small number of occasions where actually uh, a, a patient takes themselves to an urgent treatment centre uh, uh, rather than dials 999. So I think that specific point relates to in that circumstance clearly the ambulance service uh, will um, uh, 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 transport the patient to the appropriate centre of service for, for them. I think that's what that specifically is referring to. It doesn't really read like that when you read it. You think everybody who goes there needs to be moved somewhere else will be moved somewhere else free of charge. OK, I, I, I take that, that, that comment on board. Uh, but clearly, the urgent treatment centre 24-7 walk-in will be a local service. So the vast, vast majority of, of people attending will be able to have their care needs met uh, there and then in the urgent treatment centre without any requirement for, for any further transport. Any further transport would only be, I think, in the, in the scenario that I've, I've described. OK, thank you, Councillor Woodson. Uh, just before I move to the proposal, I've got a couple of brief questions. So my first is, is there a contingency plan should COVID restrictions be brought back in during the winter period for how you move forward with this consultation? Uh, I, I think it's, it says in, in the material that we'll continually sort of take notice of, of the COVID restrictions and what we can and cannot do. Clearly, at the moment, we're trying to take a blended approach between some some face to face meetings, uh, Boston yesterday, Grantham tomorrow, Lincoln on on Saturday and, and, and virtual uh, events. Clearly, even the face to face meetings are restricted because we have to work in line with the the requirements of the building uh, that we're, we're working from at, at, at that time. So um, we're doing our best. Uh, but there are still restrictions to face-to-face. To, to -face. Clearly, if there's any changes in the COVID situation uh, and, and, and more restrictions or guidance that is received, we'll, we'll take those in our stride. Uh, I, I, I think that the likely outcome would be uh, we'll probably just rebalance between uh, the sort of face-to-face -face and, the, and the virtual. Uh, so we're, keep, we're keeping it, yeah carefully monitored. That's fair to say, Charlie, anything to add? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, so long as the government guidelines um, and those venue guidelines, which are more localised, um, come into play, we'll work within those. But we want to offer that opportunity whilst we can for face to face for those people who prefer it, acting appropriately right through to the virtual 24 seven online um, events for those people who still would prefer to stay at home and get that information. Um, and probably just to add, clearly you mentioned earlier, you know, the market events and getting out and about uh, as much as we can across the community. And again, we'll, we'll continue to press on with that. And clearly, if, if additional restrictions come in, we'll, we'll have to work in line with them. OK, thank you. Um, just a, a point I've had raised with me is, although I'm pleased to see you have had good responses so far to the flyers that have gone out, I have heard from residents that they are coming through, can often be found in the middle of a Specsavers leaflet. And so it's quite difficult 
to actually always catch those people. So how are you monitoring to ensure that there aren't more of these issues and they're simply being put in the bin? So we, we know that that's always a risk, you know, and, and, and we have to uh, get this fulfilled by by someone else. Um, and so that's really helpful feedback um, and we can take that back to the provider um, and, and make sure that these are these things are being checked. Um, I think it's important that um, whilst we accept that risk, you know, and we're, not, we're being really clear that we're making every effort to get a leaflet, leaflet to every household. We're realistic that practical issues and issues such as you've just described will get in the way of that, which is why we're padding that out with other things. So, for example, other initiatives to try and reach um, people that we've got on the go is something that we used really successfully in this case county when we launched the national NHS 111 campaign so you'll recall there was a national push to try and um, highlight the availability of that um, and and we employed using text messaging through to our pay, to our service users at the time so we could reach 17,000 people people that were actively using NHS service so really kind of relevant um, people that would would um, presumably be interested and for us that got us um, in terms of the national comparison where other systems were able to bring in 20 responses a week or so, we were getting hundreds of responses to the survey that the national team were asking us to push out. So there's there's layers of activity to try and um, make sure that we reach as many people as possible. Reaching as many people as possible multiple times is absolutely fine by us. Um, and I think it's important to add here that whilst not strictly related to your question, I think you'll be pleased to know that what we focused on in terms of the questions and answers today have really been about about reaching people that would engage through potentially online or our kind of phone number, um, email address. And of course, there's lots of people that really will potentially be impacted by some of these proposals that wouldn't engage with that process. So as well as the events that we've described and John's just summarised, we've got um, we've got specific focus groups happening, which would be a bit a much more kind of concentrated discussion with people around the county. Um, we're doing telephone surveys as well so that we get a representation. We know, for example, that women are far more likely to complete a questionnaire. So that telephone survey will make sure that we, we reach as many male members of the population. Um, and then we've talked about um, kind of our seldom heard groups as well. So we've done some mosaic profiling and a lot of our events and, and flyering will focus on, on those areas. We've done easy read versions of our documents translated into the top nine um, languages across the, the county. We're recruiting involvement champions so people that aren't within the NHS but are out and about in the community. So this ranges from sixth form students right through to veterans that have volunteered for this to start to take this information out in a much more kind of third party and independent way. But we'll be have a really um, a different and effective impact in terms of engaging and encouraging people to, to respond. Um, so there's a lot. So I absolutely hear your point. We will feed that back. Thank you. But we are also realistic about these practical issues, which is why we've got this layered approach in terms of the reach and trying to encourage engagement wherever possible from as wide a variety of people geographically and otherwise across the county. Thank you, and I will apologise. We are having upgrades to our IT today, so it's not the most convenient of days, so that's why there's the back and forth, so apologies for that. Okay, I'm now going to move over to a proposal. I'd like to treat today as almost like our, our first attempt at uh, you know, looking into this and beginning our in-depth dive. So my proposal is going to be that we note the introductory presentation on the public consultation of the acute services review that we confirm the arrangements for responding to the NHS consultation on the Lincolnshire Acute Services Review in line with the following timetable. A detailed consideration of two specific elements of the Acute Services Review at each of the committee's next two meetings on the 10th of November and the 15th of December. The consideration of the interim feedback report on the consultation from the Lincolnshire Clinical Commissioning Group on the 15th of December. The establishment of one working group to draft the detailed response to the consultation and finalisation of the committee's response to the consultation on the 19th of January 2022 for submission prior to the 31st of January 2022. I will be seeking volunteers if this is seconded and supported and what my plan would be is not to be restrictive with the working group. Should you wish to take part in any element, we would certainly welcome anyone to the group. So that's my proposal. Do I have a seconder? 
Thank you, Councillor Wotton. All those in favour, please show. OK, that's supported unanimously. Thank you. Um, can I also at this point take volunteers for that working group? As I say, we will, of course, open the group up if others wish to join. Councillor Whittington. I don't see that being a problem at all, Councillor Whittington. Thank you. Have you got those, Trina? And myself. And Councillor Linda Whitten. OK. Chair, are all meetings going to be online? They will indeed, yes. They'll all be online. So it should make it easier in terms of uh, being able to attend them. OK, thank you for that. I'd just like to thank our presenters today. Thank you very much. We do appreciate it. And we'll move into agenda item six. General practice, practic access, which is on pages 99 to 102 of the agenda pack. I'd like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Kieran Sharrock, the medical director for the Lincolnshire Local Medical Committee. And also present is John Turner, chief executive of the Lincolnshire CCG, and Sarah Jane Mills, chief operating officer for the West locality of the Lincolnshire CCG. I'll now hand over to you for a quick presentation, if possible. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I guess the reason I'm here is because your constituents have been saying to you that they have poor access to their GP practices. And uh, as the official statutory representative body for general practice, it was me that got the tap on the shoulder to come and answer those questions. So clearly we understand and empathise with your concerns. It must be very upsetting for patients to feel that they can't get access to the health care that they feel that they need. Um, and clearly, 90% of NHS contacts happen in general practice. So, uh, you know, 90% of the time when patients want to, to, to seek help, they'll do it from their general practice or somewhere similar. Actually, what's interesting is that we can see from the figures that NHS Digital provide that access has actually increased. You know, we're providing more appointments now than we were pre-pandemic. I and mean, if we compare to last year, it's similar, but pre-pandemic, we, we know we're showing higher, higher numbers of consultations. Um, that's across Lincolnshire as well as the England figures. So NHS Digital have a tool where you can actually bury down into see exactly what the figures are on a CCG, regional and national level. And so why are we giving more access? How are we giving more access? Well, it's because increase uh, in workload. So we're providing more appointments because there is more work for us to do. There's patients with longer term conditions, there's their older, and also patients aren't managing their own conditions like they used to. In the old days, you'd go and speak to your granny when you had a headache or your priest when you got a bad back. But now they don't, they come to the GP. So actually, that's why we're having to provide more appointments. They're iller and there's also less self-management of cases. We're also having to field hundreds of calls from patients about their hospital care. So because the hospital's been filled with COVID patients, they're now patients who were previously managed by hospital colleagues are now having to contact their GP. Um, uh, and actually, it's not us as GPs or clinicians who are dealing with most of those calls. It's our admin teams, uh, receptionists, our care navigators are taking hundreds of calls a day from people saying, well, when's my hospital appointment going to be? And unfortunately, as a GP practice, we don't have access to that information unless we sort of access their hospital systems through uh, the care portal, which takes time. So that's why our telephone lines, our online uh, systems are, are snowed under with those sort of queries. And also hospital consultants rightly are doing remote consultations like we are. But if someone in Louth, say, or Mablethorpe contacts a consultant in Grantham about their orthopaedic problem, and the orthopaedic doctor says, well, actually, you need an X-ray. Well, how do I get the form, Mr. Consultant? Well, I'll ask your GP to do it. So that's extra work coming to general practice. Or if you need a blood test, or you need to start some medication, who's going to do that? Well, you're 70 miles away, so I'll ask someone local to do it, and that'll be your GP practice. So unfortunately, access isn't as we would like it to be, or patients feel they need it to be, but it's still very good, um, and we're having to deal with a, a very tough set of circumstances. So how have we dealt with that? Well, we've already heard about additional workforce coming into general practice. And, and uh, Mr. Turner has said, that, you know, we've got extra people like um, mental health workers, um, clinical pharmacists. But I'm not quite as optimistic as Mr. Turner because um, 
you know, Lincolnshire is significantly underspent on its um, budget for those alternative health practitioners. We, like we can't recruit GPs, we can't recruit clinical pharmacists, we can't recruit physios, we can't recruit paramedics. You know, these people are going to the bright, shiny cities where, where the work isn't quite so hard as the East Coast um, or other parts of Lincolnshire. So, you know, we are significantly underspent and I'm not as confident in our people plan to, to fill those places as John is. I'm not sure the people board has really got a grip of that. Um, what else are we doing? So we're getting new people in to do the work, but we're also using what we used to call receptionists to do care navigation. Um, and our care navigators aren't just receptionists, they're people who've had training to understand the needs of the population. And obviously they're, they're not doctors, they're not nurses, but you know, when someone says to them they've got chest pain, they understand that's someone that might need an ambulance, that might need to be someone who gets seen today if it doesn't sound like cardiac chest pain. So what we ask is that the, the population do give a little bit of information to the care navigators, either online or when they speak to them on the telephone, so they can best direct them. So when someone rings up and says, oh, I've got a problem with my diabetes, I tell you the last person you want to speak to is me, because my diabetic nurse in the room next door has 10 times the knowledge of diabetes that I do. But if the patient insists on seeing a GP, she's going to, unfortunately, the patient will get a, a less good service than they would from my diabetic colleague, diabetic specialist colleague. Um, we've also introduced total triage. So, you know, we can identify those patients who need to be seen sooner. Now, this is something that a lot of practices were doing pre-pandemic, but since the pandemic, because of social distancing and having to do things remotely, we're now all doing total triage. So we get a bit of information to our care navigators, and then we're prioritising people to see the most appropriate professional um, uh, for their need, but also in a more timely fashion. And the question I'm sure you'll ask is, well, what proportion of your patients are being seen face to face? Well, more than 50 percent of our patients are being see, seen face to face. I have got the figures that I put it in the report. Um, and most of those people are actually being seen on the day that they contact us. So gone of the days of sitting and waiting for three weeks for you to see someone or four weeks or five weeks. Now, 67 percent of the, the, the people we see are being seen on the day they ring up to ask to be seen. So if they need a face to face appointment, they're getting it. And we're assessing them and referring them or managing the condition. Anyway, I've, I've put out in the report um, the things we're doing. There are still things we need to do. We could improve our telephone access for sure. And uh, we certainly need to have more clinicians. Um, you know, I'm not sure that we've got a plan for how we're going to fill that gap of 250 GPs. Um, my concern is that my colleagues who are a diabetic specialist nurse or a physiotherapist or a mental health practitioner, they can deal with that condition really well. But as a GP, I deal with the whole patient. I deal with their social problem, their psychological problem and their physical problem all together. That's what a GP is a specialist in. Um, so we need to replace those GPs. Um, and yes, we also need to have those specialist colleagues working alongside us. But um, I, I'm not sure we have a plan for that yet. And uh, I'm pleased to see that John and Sarah Jane are here to answer that concern of mine as well as yours. Thank you for that, Karen. Hello from with questions. I've got Councillor Allen first, please. Um, thank you very much um, for your for the report and your summary on it as well. Um, and um, I think it's fairly clear that it's resources that are needed, particularly GP resources, um, in my view. I've got a question for you on your um, um, on your figures. The face to face element. Are these genuine links here face to face? You know, you the person there, because there's been some report that some of the NHS figures consider um, a video face to face as, as a face to face. Uh, I can only answer for what NHS Digital tell me. I can only use their figures, and I don't know whether they use video as being face to face. Um, but uh, so that's all I can say. I'm sorry. All right, thank you. Can either John or Sarah Jane, do you have a lot more information, perhaps, on that particular item? Um, hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Jane. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at. Um, the Lincolnshire CCG and I've got the lead uh, for the CCG in terms of primary care. In terms of the question you've just asked, obviously um, data is only ever as good as the data that goes into the system. But what I can tell you is in addition to the face-to-face -face information, we do also get information about uh, the number of telephone consultations and the number of video consultations. So um, based on the fact that we get the full picture, I would assume that the, that, that is about face-to-face. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Cleaver. 
thank you. Um, thank you for your report. Um, I'm sure many people, many members of the public are fully aware that there are workforce problems in terms of uh, the recruitment of GPs, the number of GPs, a lot of GPs are re retirement. I'm not sure that they're aware that there is a well thought out um, program to mitigate that. Uh, I think you really have a problem of communication here. I I'm constantly hearing uh, from my residents uh, that their expectations are not being met. And I think there's a question of their expectations not being well managed, in, especially in terms of, of what you call total triage, um, a, a phrase I hadn't heard until I, I received the papers for this meeting. Um, and the other thing I'd just like to mention is, um, in the conclusions, you say a recruitment campaign is likely to be required, which slightly bemuses me because it sounds from what's in the rest of the report that it's absolutely essential rather than likely to be required. I think your, your points are well made. Um, certainly expectations haven't been managed um, and the communications haven't been good enough. Um, in fact, funnily enough, myself and uh, Ms Mills and uh, one of the comms team met yesterday to discuss this very matter. And we do want to have a consistent message that, you know, care navigators are trained professionals and that you no know, total triage is here to stay. And I think you know, having this conversation with you guys is part of that comms campaign um, to, to explain why we've done what we've done and why it needed to happen and why it needs to continue. Um, and in terms of the, the plan for recruitment being essential, I would completely agree with you. And my concern is I'm not invited to the people board. I'm not part of the people board. And that's why I'm almost raising it with you as a concern. You know, we need to hold the people board to account. You know, what is your plan to not underspend the the budget for the NHS staff in primary care by over one and a half million a, a year and why is the budget underspent and what are you going to do about the 250 people gap in general practice in of general practitioners thank you thank you just building on realistically from what Councillor Cleaver said, can anything be elaborated on regards to what the plan's going to be in terms of recruitment, John or Sarah Jane? Perhaps if I make some opening comments and then Sarah Jane can come in and um, add, add to them. I think the fundamental points that Kieran made are absolutely spot on. So uh, the sort of three things I'd just like to, to, to really emphasise and to the committee. First, first is uh, our GPs in Lincolnshire have done an absolutely outstanding job over the last 18 months, they and their teams. Uh, I know we've all been through the ringer, but they have really been through it uh, across the county. And uh, I, I just think we should just, just recognise how very difficult it has been for primary care teams across the, the county. And my observation is that they have done a superb uh, job. Um, in, in terms of the second point, as Kieran's described, you know, primary care has uh, evolved, huge, transformed rapidly in that in that period to the the total triage, the digital uh, access, and so on, uh, which I think is 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 has been something we had been talking about for quite a while prior to the pandemic, uh, but obviously we've had to move really really quickly uh, on that. I think that we still need to think about and reflect on. Um, where in some circumstances it might not be appropriate for for, for patients uh, and uh, we will continue to 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 do that um, but as you as you can see primary care is dealing with a level of demand uh, uh, which is greater than that prior to the to the pandemic and i think done exceptionally well and the third point is that we have been and we continue to pay attention to what people, patients, citizens across the county say about their actual experience of, of accessing primary care. Uh, we hear lots of good things about how it's working, but obviously people do have concerns as well. And this might be the point about expectations uh, that, they, that they have. So we'll, we'll continue to, to, to work on, on that. Um, prior to the pandemic, the NHS in the country had and clearly still has a massive sort of workforce crisis. I think that's been very well documented. Over 100,000 uh, unfilled posts in the in the country. Um, uh, locally, uh, for example, um, 
uh, ULHT um, uh, have an agency and locum bill of between about 40 and 50 million pounds a year. Uh, that's 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 the cost of that workforce shortage in that trust, let alone the rest of the NHS in the in in the county. Uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, the challenges that we now have, um, uh, clearly we've moved forward. You're dealing with some of them, but the point that Kira makes fundamentally about GP numbers uh, is still an ongoing serious concern. Um, uh, it's obviously multifactorial. Uh, the government uh, committed to, I think it was 6,000 additional GPs in the, in the country a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it's fair to say there's still significant progress that requires to be made on that. It's about training. It's about getting people into to universities, about where the universities are. Clearly, um, uh, yeah, we made great progress in, in, in Lincoln uh, with that. It's about recruitment. Uh, but it's equally about retention. Um, uh, and there are lots of ideas that we have, uh, which again, uh, we've been discussing with Kira and other colleagues through the summer about uh, things that we need to, to uh, pay attention to, particularly how we can retain GPs who uh, perhaps are coming to, to the, the end of their sort of full time career on a more extended uh, basis in the, in the county. Um, so uh, there un it undoubtedly is a massive challenge. Um, it's spot on. Uh, the recruitment campaign um, is is essential, but the description of it as a campaign, I, th I think almost as if it's an event, it's got to be a core part of how we, uh, you know, uh, uh, continue to support um, general practice and its future in the in the county. So. Um, we can come back on another occasion to the people plan and all of that. And as I said earlier, very happy to facilitate that. And I'll ask Sarah Jane if she wants to come in on a point I've skipped over or omitted. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Kieran. Um, workforce is a challenge. It's a challenge nationally, not just in Lincolnshire. But I think we are very aware that uh, across general practice, both in our um, GPs and our uh, nursing workforce, they are approaching uh, a lot of them, not all of them, uh, retirement. And, and so we have been um, working on that for some time. Um, and we, in relation to uh, general practice, I mean, Kieran was instrumental in terms of the international recruitment, which uh, Lincolnshire led the way on. And we've been very successful and that work continues. Similarly, over the last uh, 12 months, uh, we've actually recruited the highest number in the uh, Midlands region in terms of uh, uh, newly qualified doctors with 38 salaried GPs joining us. Um, that's not enough um, by any stretch of the imagination because uh, as soon as the GPs are joining us, others are retiring, which is why, uh, as John has referred to, it's important for us to retain that expertise, whether that be clinically or by mentoring uh, GP, new GPs coming online. We also have 108, um, what we describe as first five, and that network um, of bringing together people who are uh, newly qualified is, is seen very positively by newly qualified GPs. So in terms of general practice, yes, uh, and recruiting GP uh, workforce, there's a lot to do. Similarly, in GP nurses, um, actually the uh, range of uh, GP nurses, there are more, um, a higher percentage likely to retire in the next five to 10 years. Um, and Lincolnshire um, is very pleased that we have got 15 nurse associates working in general practice. And historically, the tra training roles for um, practice nurses um, were quite limited and people moved to general practice once they developed their careers uh, in hospital settings. So again, uh, really positive in terms of uh, developing that. Um, I'd like to reassure members that actually the People Board are um, considering uh, general practice and primary care workforce. And we do have um, one of our clinical directors from the primary care network uh, sitting um, as a, um, a, a member uh, of that um, People's Board. Uh, and Dr Thomas has worked very, very hard um, in recent months um, with EMAS to look at how we can develop 
um, an integrated um, service so that we can secure paramedics working in general practice. And I think this starts to demonstrate the importance of not just looking at this in isolation, but looking at this through um, different professional routes. Um, as an occupational therapist myself, I know that working in isolation um, in, a, in a team that's multidisciplinary is actually quite um, difficult and quite challenging. So our recruitment strategies and our development plans are about how do we um, work with colleagues in our other providers so that we can build a professional career development um, pathway that enables people to work in hospital settings, in the community, in primary care. Um, and we've got some fantastic examples in terms of the first contact practitioners, a number of whom are actually employed by uh, LCHS, um, but actually work um, within their primary care network. Um, we haven't got nearly enough um, people um, in terms of matching the demand um, and uh, as Kieran has highlighted you know there's much more to do in terms of building the strategy uh, and developing that but we have got examples um, of where when we've considered do how we've done that um, we've actually recruited very well so we've got 58 clinical pharmacists which is one of the highest um, in the region in terms of um, presence in, in primary care networks. And that's been, again, because we've developed a bit of a hierarchy. So much, much more to do. Um, but the people board have got attention of it. Um, but it is this wider multidisciplinary team, not just the uh, general practice, which um, colleagues uh, and Kieran are very instrumental in developing. OK, thanks, Sarah Jane. I've got uh, Councillor Whittington next. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I've got some um, some kind of mixed experiences um, of this. I've got, from my own personal experience, I've, I've got two long sort of long term conditions. I've got I do a back operation for two for two prolapsed discs, and that's managed at the moment. Um, unfortunately, it's before the Grantham trauma because I'm being sent to the place in Peterborough for the next operation. But um, I, I can have telephone conversations conversations with the consultant she's great saves me having to having to go to peterborough when i had a problem with the back was really painful i was able to use ask my gp didn't have to go and see the gp i got referred and had a course of physiotherapy to help the problem and i could order all of my prescriptions online without having to bother the gp so i think for people who've got underlying long-term conditions it, it can it, it can work really really well because you know, there's a lot less time to actually have to go in to see GPs. The feedback I am getting is, is, is where people are concerned. It's you've got something like I mean I I, I use an example that affected a member of my family who had the symptoms of what were was it could have been a cold it could have been a it could have been flu it actually was meningitis. And resulted in brain damage because it wasn't diagnosed properly and my concern i think is always going to be it's those conditions where the symptoms could be a cold or flu but it could be meningitis and if people can't get access to their gps potentially because because you're feeling the symptoms and it could be something fairly minor but it could be something really serious and also you know, because we're hearing the the people potentially maybe missing out on, on on cancer diagnoses as well because they can't get access through to their GPs, and it's those kind of serious things that potentially could be missed because the face-to-face -face contact with a GP that may actually be able to identify what what the cause of the problem is. So my concerns are around that, and so what I'm picking up from, from local residents is around that, and just what what can be done to kind of flag up potentially symptoms or things or maybe a way of just trying to i don't know it could, it could, be, it could be down to training communications just how, how you tease that information out of patients contacting surgeries to sort of flag up things that may offer that may that may be really concerning um and then and then also potentially the knock-on effect that could have then have on a and e and utc services because if people can't see their gp they might just give up and go well i'll go up to in Grantham, then go up 
to Grantham, you know, hospital. So, uh, and particularly impact that could have there in terms of increasing the numbers. So just a, just, just a few sort of comments and views and views around how to manage those particular, particular issues, I think, will be quite useful. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Yes, I mean, that sounds like a, a very distressing situation for your family member. Um, but unfortunately, you know, there is not the capacity within any health system to see everyone who has a cold or a cough or a fever. And the reason that, that most people don't need to is because most people do just have a cold or a cough or a bit of a, a bug. You know, even if it's coronavirus, most people with coronavirus don't get unwell. We know some people do. So we have to have systems in place which um, allow people to assess their own symptoms and make contact when they're not getting better or if they're getting worse. And we have to have symptoms systems in place where um, someone with not the highest level of medical skill can assess those patients and then reassure if that's appropriate or signpost on and, and get seen by a, a more senior clinician if necessary. So not all systems are going to be perfect, but what we have to do is work with what we've got. So where we are overloaded with workload and under-resourced in terms of um, clinicians, we have to have a system in place where for the majority and the vast majority, so 99 out of 100 times or overly 999 out of 1,000 times, we get it right. But unfortunately, there are going to be those times where things slip through the net. And it sounds like that's one of the things that happened in the case of your family member. But, you know, I say to people sometimes, well, I, I heard about someone who crossed the road and got hit by a bus, but that doesn't stop me crossing the road. So we are doing it right the vast, vast majority of the time. And of course, the sad situation where it doesn't happen is the one that hits the news, because I don't hear about those 999 people who crossed the road and got to the other side. You only hear about the one who got hit by the bus. So, you know, it's very sad and it's, it's, it'd be nice if we had the capacity within a health system to deal with everybody's wants, but actually we have to deal in what is needed and a lot of the time people want advice from someone, but actually that's what's not what's needed. And that means the person who does need it doesn't get it because actually the person who doesn't have the access, the, the frail older person who's stuck in their house, who thinks, oh, I won't call the doctor, I won't call the surgery because I know they're really busy because we're busy with people who really shouldn't be calling us. I can give you an example. Someone who booked a face-to-face -face appointment, insisted they have a face-to-face -face appointment with me because they couldn't be dealt with by anybody else. When they came into my room, they said, I want you to sign this piece of paper to say I'm fit to do a charity parachute jump. And I said, well, for one, that's not an NHS service because you know, that's, you're know that's healthy, you're not actually unwell, so you didn't need to see a doctor. And I could have signed this piece of paper if you left it for me at the front desk. So that was a 15 minute appointment wasted because someone felt they needed it. But well, they didn't. They wanted it. And actually, that meant that somebody else who probably did need to see me couldn't get in. So unfortunately, you know, we have to build the system around what is needed, not what's wanted. And in terms of going to A&E, yes, myself, something that myself and Sarah Jane have discussed on many occasions, we should have a system whereby we, we take that 20 percent of patients who have frailty, chronic diseases, long term conditions, and we look after them in a holistic way. But those 80 percent of the population who actually only turn up once every year or twice a year have somewhere else for them to go so that they can contact that and they'll get a quick response. Because what we need to then do is have the people with the skills like myself for holistic care of the frail older patient can deal with those. And then people who are good at dealing with on the day conditions can deal with, with those sort of people. Uh, but we haven't kind of got that system. We're looking that we might have to move to that in the future. Thank you. Dr. Wookie. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Karen, for your presentation. Very concise and um, clear. Um, <coughs> I could obviously as the next GP talk for about an hour on this, but uh, you'll be pleased that I'm not just going to concentrate on really questions arising from the feedback that we get at Healthwatch uh, about primary care. And I say primary care rather than GP care specifically, because I think the two are interrelated and part of the same whole. Um, and I think things have levelled off to some extent, but um, access is still the major problem that we're getting reported to us. Um, and I think there are two facets to that, really. One is the problem of getting through at all uh, on the phone. Uh, and the second is the care navigator side of it, once you are through. And I think we have to accept that there is a, com a great variation 
between practices as to how quickly you get through. Some will talk and the people in this room will say we have no problem. Others will say we wait half an hour and the phone goes dead and then we have to start again. Uh, and there is no doubt in that second group, a lot of people just give up uh, and, and they're not the people who are uh, acutely ill. They're the people who may have the early symptoms of more serious illness. And it's already been quoted about somebody with a headache, which very rarely, but definitely can sometimes be due to meningitis or a, a similar serious condition. And the same with abdominal pain, which is perhaps even more so. So something actually still needs attention, perhaps in specific areas uh, on um, the, the telephone access issue. And I would like to know just how that is progressing um, um, through the CCG. Obviously, we've worked closely with the CCG in some of these difficult uh, areas, but uh, it still seems to be uh, cropping up. It, it's going to take time, but I'd like to be reassured that things are moving. And the other issue is relating to that is the care navigator issue. Um, when you are actually through, and I think it is asking a lot of somebody who's had a fairly short training to be able to pick up what we would call the red flags um, that are mentioned over the phone or even amber flags, um, the sorts of things that might be mentioned by the patient as an afterthought, but actually turns something that sounds innocuous to something that is very far from innocuous. And at that stage, I think that has to be referred on uh, to a health professional, usually the GP, uh, to sign. So I don't, I think it's, it's fine having care navigators call them what you want, as long as they have clear understanding and instructions as to what they do and what they don't do. Uh, and if they have any doubts about uh, situations and they can't say to themselves that this is definitely not uh, something to worry about immediately, then it should be referred on. And I'm not sure that is always happening at the moment. Uh, so, and then, so it would be interesting to know what the Karen and uh, <coughs> Sarah feel about that. Um, and then I wanted to just go on to some of the solutions to all this. And uh, uh, Kieran has mentioned primary care home, um, which I think is a really very interesting concept. And it's, it's been around for a year or two, but I'm sure, Kieran, you'll know a lot more about this than I do, but I've done a sort of bit of reading on it. And uh, it's something really which is an expansion of the old primary care um, uh, teams, which were much smaller, but were derived from both various backgrounds. And it, it was a bit depressing. And we're, we're already talking about number six and item seven, aren't we? That the, the, the document that came from the CCG on item seven did not mention LCHS once. And LCHS is part of primary care. Uh, and that that is mentioned when you look at primary care home, uh, where there are people, it doesn't really matter who's, who's giving them the paycheck at the end of the month. What matters to the patient is that there is a team of people who are communicating with each other and, and they're working closely to each other and people don't really mind too much then who it actually is. But so I think the line that's being drawn most recently in the last 10 years between community health services and GP services, which used to be much more flexible and there was much more interworking, needs to be put into reverse because they are as important in this uh, as are um, all the other people who quite rightly are being involved. It's going to take time, but I think we do need to have perhaps a regular updates on how things are going. You can't do this in six months, but, and I, I, I think, you know, GPs have had a lot of stick, which is not a lot of it, which is not justified. Uh, and so the communication as um, has already been mentioned is, is really, really important.
So I would just like some updates uh, on those that I can take back to my colleagues. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I'm just going to remember the bit where you said GPs have been working hard and a lot of the criticism hasn't been justified. I've, I've made a note of that. Um, I think one of the things that you said which really rings home to me is the variation. Um, and this is something myself, John and Sarah Jane and the rest of our colleagues in with the CCG and the LMC have discussed at quite length about how do we reduce the variation from practice to practice. And obviously, primary care networks may have a role in that because if you can get systems across one whole primary care network then at least it's going to be the same across those but at the moment we've got 86 practices and they do run things in slightly different ways they have different telephone um, operators they have different staffing models they different have different estate and whilst you've got that you're always going to have some sort of variation but what we, we as a system as, a, as a leaders we need to be able to say um, this is actually good practice from over there. Why don't you try this? How do we help you? And actually, we're having discussions at the moment about for setting up something like a task force of a practice manager, a GP, a, um, a nurse who can go into practice and say, this is what we've seen in other places. Why don't you try this? How can we support you? And that's something we would really like to do. And yes, it's very frustrating that you can't get necessarily through on the telephone. But what's frustrating for us from the other end is that people ring up and they could have done something online. Um, because what happens is the people who then don't have access online don't have the access to the telephone. Um, so, you know, if you've got access to use the online tools, do that, because that then frees the telephone lines up for the people who can't use the online things. In terms of the care navigators, um, absolutely, we, what we don't want them to be doing is making clinical diagnosis or managing patients. Their, their role is purely to navigate people to the right person to deal with their problem. So when someone rings up and says, I want a, 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 a medical so that I can jump out of a plane, they say, well, actually don't, just drop the paperwork in. That doesn't need an appointment at all. We can fill that in without that. Oh, I've got a problem with my diabetes. Well, I can get you seen by the diabetic nurse. Or I've got an acute symptom and I'm not really sure what it is. Well, actually, you need to speak to someone who can diagnose and, and assess you. And that will then come through to a GP or a nurse practitioner who can do that. Um, so what we don't want is, is for those care navigators to be doing that. But what we have done is given them training in red and amber flags. So when someone says chest pain, pretty much they go straight through to um, um, you know a, a GP or a or a nurse practitioner, or they're advised to call an ambulance if if they if they get that sort of information. Um, you know, chest pain may well not need to see a GP or a nurse practitioner because it might be a pulled muscle, better to see a physiotherapist. But still, the red flag thing has been done. They do have training in identifying those red flags. And once again, I say it's not perfect. And I'm sure some people get a bad experience from it, but we, we do try. Um, in terms of primary care home, I think that it's a model that we've talked about for a number of years where we separate the 20% of population who need intense um, holistic care from a uh, multidisciplinary team from the 80% of the population who just need the acute care as and when they require it. You know, I need my pill check or I need, um, I pulled my back or whatever. You know, we know that 80% of the population hardly ever see their GP and 20% of them need the GP practice a lot. So that's that's the model that we really should be looking at. Um, and some parts of the country have done it very well. And I know Stamford are talking about doing it to a greater degree, but I think as a system, as a, as a county, we probably need to look at how we do that because it's, it's a more efficient way of managing patients because that way they get to see the sort of person for them that they need to see. But it's a discussion, isn't it? Because, you know, you might be one of the 80%, but you might be told, well, actually, your GP practice no longer wants to see you. You'll go to the place 15 minutes down the road or half an hour down the road because they're better suited to dealing with your sort of problem. Obviously, the people who can't travel and the people who need care close to home, the chronically ill, the older patients probably would keep being that 20 percent. We'd put in sort of the red category, need to be kept in their own GP surgery with a multidisciplinary team. So, yeah, I mean, these are things that we're discussing and it's working out how we make the model work for the population of Lincolnshire. And that is something that myself, John and Sarah Jane have discussed. Thank Carl. you. Could Sarah Jane perhaps answer the questions about the CCG? Um, yes, uh, uh, thank you. Um, so, um, 
Firstly, can I say thank you because um, colleagues from Health Watch really do help us get an insight of, of um, what patients find difficult. Um, and uh, on the back of the feedback we did have about the challenges people were uh, having getting through on the phone, we did actually do a, a, an audit and rang every single practice, not just once, but a number of different times at uh, points in the day. Um, and it's fair to say that there was significant variation. I mean, you would expect there be to be high periods of demand during the day, but there was significant um, variation with some people getting answered within a minute uh, and some being um, in excess of 10 minutes. Um, and what that enabled us to do was actually um, go to those practices um, and, and understand what were the issues. And they they were varied. Sometimes it was literally that this is a fluke. It was just that it was a, a high level of demand. But that wasn't the norm in terms of the problems. There, there tended to be um, two main problems. One was the telephone infrastructure. Um, and um, through our um, digital um, investment, um, we are um, supporting a number of practices um, to replace their telephone system. Um, it just wasn't fit to be able to do the job. It couldn't take messages. It couldn't um, tell you what was uh, happening. Um, so there's a number of practices where we, uh, we are helping them in terms of uh, replacing the telephone system. The other was actually um, a much more practical issue in terms of the practice was aware that they needed more people to answer the phone. They'd actually got the phone system to enable them to do that, but they hadn't got the physical space to be able to accommodate those extra people. Um, and so um, we're working with those practices in a number of ways. So um, we've got one um, practice that's got a number of sites across the county. They've actually developed um, a telephone hub so that phones can be diverted. It doesn't mean that you aren't seen in your practice, but basically the phone can be han uh, answered somewhere physically different uh, and then they can uh, book you into appointments. Um, so we've got some um, where we're doing those sort of examples. Um, we have got others where um, our uh, estates team are actually supporting uh, a practice to um, uh, put the notes uh, onto digital uh, and that physically creates space um, for those um, practices to be able to house not just the additional receptionists but also um, the um, additional clinicians that are needed in the practice um, and in some instances where we haven't been able to do that um, we've um, physically taken the notes and stored them elsewhere. And then the third thing which um, I was going to pick up in, in my report is we have got an estate strategy um, and in a number of areas we um, are looking at how we can invest um, funding that we get through um, housing development, Section 106 funding, um, to make sure that we've got the physical capacity. And the work we've been doing with planners is um, to say sometimes it won't be appropriate for that to be at the actual practice. It will be about developing like a telephone hub and things like that. So we're, we're doing all of those things and we will be repeating that uh, audit um, to make to see that we're making progress. But um, that's where working closely with uh, Health Watch um, helps us give us that insight and actually know where to focus. Very quickly, um, Gemma, um, you've not mentioned my comments about LCHS. Um, Sorry, you, you, I... men you mentioned EMAS earlier, but not uh, LCHS. Okay. We've got to break down these barriers okay. between the various trusts and the various GPs and uh, other sources because um, the patients just want a team. They don't want people not knowing what somebody else is doing, although they're in the same road. You know, district nurses were in danger of going back to the Morris Minor sort of concept that we used to watch on television. Um, uh, apologies for that. Um, so um, you're absolutely right, and I didn't reference uh, any organisations in my paper other than uh, focusing on general practice. Um, the primary care networks, um, their primary um, focus 
Um, you can call it primary care home or you can um, call it lots of other things, but their primary focus is bringing together um, all the professionals working in an area or in more than one area um, in terms of uh, the expertise so that we focus on the needs of the population. Um, and we have got some great examples of um, work that is happening um, in relation to that. So one of the things the primary care networks um, have done over the last 12 months is establish, um, it's called the Enhanced Health for Care, care Homes Project. Um, and each primary care network has identified um, the care homes that sit in their network that then they are responsible for. And they then work together with all the professionals who support the patients um, in, in the care homes. And this is an example of the sort of work um, that is ongoing in terms of not just people living in care homes, but in their own homes as well. And that multidisciplinary team comprises of um, somebody from general practice, um, the community nursing, um, in some instances, colleagues from the Mental Health Trust, particularly where that is relevant because the home is supporting people with learning disabilities or people with a mental health, people from the care home themselves because they bring expertise uh, and knowledge um, and a whole range of people that actually come together not to individually look at um, the patients and do the crossing uh, in the doorway that um, you'd be aware of, Dr Wookie, you know, a GP coming in when the district nurse is, uh, is leaving, but actually to review what the needs are of those individual um, patients in a very proactive way so that we're anticipating what their needs might be and starting to proactively plan. And that is the big change in terms of rather than waiting for patients um, to um, have a crisis, um, we actually start working with the 20% the, the that Kieran's highlighting that have got long-term conditions uh, and ongoing needs. And we're working with them, not as just a GP practice, but as part of that multidisciplinary team. Um, and that is one of the primary objectives of the primary care networks. Um, and, and that is supported by all of our um, organisations. John, you'd like to come up? If I could just add, please. Um, whilst we're dealing with the pandemic, the vaccinations, uh, the elective challenges, support and general practice, uh, and all of the rest of it I mentioned earlier, you might be aware uh, that subject to the passage of legislation through Parliament, uh, uh, we in Lincolnshire, as across the rest of England, uh, will develop into a statutory integrated care system uh, from the 1st of April uh, next year. Um, that's a sub separate subject, but the, the point I really want to make in, in response to, to, to Brian is that um, the care between general practice and community services is not integrated as we're here today. Equally, it is not integrated with care homes, with the third sector, with community hospitals, with community mental health services, so on. It is not integrated. Uh, yes, there are great patches of great teamwork and great proactive work, but it is not consistently integrated in Lincolnshire, out in our communities, uh, around our GP practices, and actually it isn't integrated either between primary care and our hospital uh, <coughs> services either. It's not to say there isn't some brilliant people doing great work day in, day out. There clearly are. But um, as we develop into an integrated care system, I think that lack of integration will now become uh, unacceptable to us. Uh, and uh, uh, we will have a far more, what we call an integrating mindset across not just the NHS, but the health and care system, because fundamentally that is what uh, patients want. They want care designed around their needs that is integrated and joined up. Um, so um, on the back of Brian's comments about the very obvious lack of integration between primary care and community health services, um, I just want to make that that broad point. And I know that as we go forward, the committee will want to pay attention to how much progress uh, we're making on that. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. 
I've got four more speakers that I'm going to bring in uh, and then I'm going to close down the debate and move on to the next item. However, just building on from some of the complaints that have been received by Healthwatch, I just wanted to actually mention a personal issue where I was unable to get through to my doctors. So I entirely get the frustrations that are coming forward at the moment in time. But knowing what I know from doing this committee, I thought I would try an e-consultation. Uh, I did it, found it dead easy. I was really quite impressed with it, to be honest until it advised me I'd be contacted by half past six the following day, at which point nothing happened. There was a link within that email where I clicked to let them know that I hadn't been contacted. Two days later, nothing. In the end, I ended up at the UTC to be told by that UTC, this is not uncommon, this happens all the time, and we are regularly now under masses of pressure because certainly in my area, the GPs just aren't seeing people face to face. And that is one thing that is being raised regularly. In fact, one GP surgery in our area was actually directing people who had cold symptoms to go to the UTC and not visit the GP practice. So there is those discrepancies there. And it is a very big concern, I think, amongst our residents. And I, I wonder how this is actually being overseen and how this is actually looked into. Um, thank you. And I'm... I'm sorry to hear that you had that experience. I think um, the issues you raise um, uh, in terms of um, there's two parts in terms of that, clearly in terms of uh, reviewing and uh, understanding what is happening at, at uh, practice level. We do have a, a quality team. Um, they have, um, as we all have, been um, working to support the response in terms of COVID and particularly responding, supporting the uh, work in terms of vaccinations. But in terms of the overview, in terms of what's happening at practices, we do get feedback from patients uh, and we do investigate that feedback. And we also get feedback from uh, Healthwatch directly um, and have an agreement with them that if there is a specific issue around a specific patient's um, experience as a practice, they actually share the practice with us so that we can go and investigate. Because, as you say, there's variability and we'll certainly uh, investigate that we also have uh, routine um, um, forums um, so colleagues from the LMC um, health watch and also CQC sit alongside um, uh, colleagues from quality and uh, my own team to get that 360 view of what is happening in practices because sometimes we don't hear all of the feedback because people just move on uh, and so we have that forum which gives us an opportunity um, in a safe space for people to share concerns about individual practices and in that forum we then are able to agree how we will um, investigate that further so we have a very clear and structured process to gather as much information that information also includes um, obviously complaints uh, and feedback that we get through our normal uh, routes uh, and also um, any information we get through incidents so we we've established that 360 uh, forum um, in terms of um, the um, feedback uh, around the urgent uh, treatment center um, there's there's two answers to that. So one, if people are sending uh, patients inappropriately to an urgent treatment centre, we will get that feedback again from colleagues in uh, the Community Health Trust. There are, though, some examples which is linked to what Kieran was saying about how can we better utilise the totality of resources that we have in our community so that um, if we have got high demands in uh, general practice, but our urgent treatment centre team, who are equally competent, haven't got any patients, that doesn't seem a good use of the total resource. So um, both in uh, the Skegness area and uh, currently in Lincoln City, we have a, a we are testing where GP practices can actually book patients into the uh, urgent treatment centre and have a face-to-face -face appointment in that facility where that is appropriate for their needs. And that is as starting, as, as Kieran's highlighted, starting to 
um, understand how we use the totality of resources to meet patient needs. I don't know which it is in terms of your experience, Carl, because um, it could be either in that area. Um, but certainly if the demand is um, greater and there seems to be a high level of activity from more practice, we would investigate that. It's interesting because I, I see this from both sides and, I, and I, I feel the pain of both the patient and the, and the practice. Um, as a clinician, uh, I know that there's something called decision fatigue. And after a certain amount of times I've had to make a decision about a clinical case, you start making bad decisions. They see this in the airline industry. They see it in lots of industries that once you've made a certain number of decisions, you start making bad decisions. Um, in medicine, that's been estimated to be around about 35 decisions a day. So if you make more than 35 clinical decisions in a day, then you start making bad decisions. Now, I regularly hit the 100 mark, and that's just individual patients. So let's say I'm making two decisions for each of those patients. So that's over 200 decisions. So I must be making bad decisions. So at some point, we have to have a, a system which protects me from making bad decisions and the fallout from that. But more to the point, protects the patient from me making a bad decision. So at what point do I then say, well, actually, it's not safe for me to continue and I need to send you to the urgent treatment centre? And this is the problem with us dealing with um, the patient's want. Because if the patient wants to speak to me and I make a couple of decisions on behalf of that patient, that's eating away at my resilience. Now, if it's a patient need, as in there's a patient with frailty, multiple long-term conditions, and they really needed my, my input, then I should be definitely the right person to be doing that. But if, I, if, if, um, if we can send someone to the urgent treatment centre and save me making two urgent decisions, then maybe that means that I can then help someone with frailty who, you know, who, who, who someone else couldn't be involved with. And it's a really difficult balance and it's something we need to, as, a, as, a, as an organisation, an NHS, we need to work out how to protect myself from burnout, protect patients from bad decisions. Thank you. I think there's also the element of protecting those in the UTC from burnout from the extra additional workload they have, of course, as well. Yeah, thank you. OK, I've got Councillor Woodliffe next. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I suppose my issue again is, as, as previously, it's bound to communications. Uh, communications between the patient and the GP and communications between the GP and the hospital. And I refer to something in front of me, which again, I've referred to recently, well, today actually, and a particular person said to me, I'm concerned for others and myself about the lack of communication between your local GP and the hospital. I have witnessed this firsthand. I was under the impression we were all using System 1 Mosaic, which allows some flow of information, but apparently not. And he goes on to say elsewhere, uh, as your GP has sent you to hospital in the first place, it would be appropriate for them to advance your notes and keep up to date with your progress. Or am I just stating the obvious? That's one aspect. And the other aspect, of course, is communication between the GP and patients itself. My surgery it seems to rely upon the snail mail system. You know, we send out a letter. Um, I have, um, I'm asthmatic and uh, I had a review. I was asked to go for a review in September and I went for that review. And then about a week or so later, I get a letter saying, come for a review, which is a duplication of the process. So I ring up and say, yes, well, I've already had that review and so on. It, it seems to me that... Um, in this particular area, maybe, maybe um, we ought to go into the 21st century. Uh, my sister-in-law tells me that in Cambridge, um, her, her doctor communicates with by text message and email, amongst other things, and doesn't rely upon stamped addressed envelopes. Perhaps um, in Lincolnshire, we move to move into the 21st century, and perhaps um, also use um, text messages and email. Perhaps we ought to ask patients to supply that information if they haven't got it already. So as to speed up things, it seems to be a bit daft to rely upon the um, the post office, you know, a and a second class stamp to get the message through. So there are these issues with communication. I'm sure the system would work a lot better if communication was better. And I suspect that patients would feel a lot better if they could um, know that their you know, concerns are being picked up. Um, and the other thing about this report, actually, it's quite good on page 102, I think it's of this here. Yeah? Reducing the workload, well, I completely agree with that. Um, of course, that's a matter for the councils, isn't it? Our selected members as such, 
And it's a public health matter, which I'm very, very strongly in favour of. And it talks about the focus on um, better housing. Yep, we need a bit more money on improving housing for, for people. Better jobs. Yes, yeah, definitely true in Boston. Better education. That's not an issue in Boston. Better transport. Um, more walking. Less car travelling. Better eating. Less Big Macs, I think, perhaps. Um, another big uh, McDonald's opening up in um, in Boston. More Big big Macs being sold, no doubt. Adding to the um, bulk, which I dare say. All these things matter. So we've got one side, we've got the communications issue, which I think is critical to the whole service. And I think comes maybe the integrated service will perhaps resolve this. Move into the 21st century with text messages like my dentist does. My dentist is very good. He sends me text messages all the time when I need an appointment and so on. Excellent. But my doctor can't seem to do that or the GP's practice can't do that. So communications. And then there's this bit about um, improving or reducing the pressure on the system by making people's lives a bit better with better housing, better jobs, better education, better transport, better food hmm, and less dependence on the Big Mac. Um, my comments are as such. I don't know how you will receive those, uh, Dr. Dr. Sherrock. Is it, um, does that resonate with you? <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, uh, to take your points one at a time, I mean, I totally agree. Um, communication is key. Um, I wish we all had one NHS IT system, but unfortunately we don't. Market forces, apparently you have to have market forces in, in all things. So um, you have to allow an open playing field for different people to bid for different parts. I mean, I think the ULHT has eight different IT systems which talk a little bit. Um, you know, there's, there's two GP medical note systems in Lincolnshire because we've just managed to get our last practice on the third to, to change over. So, but we still have that issue. We do have the care portal, which I think is a really, really good facility for communication, but not everyone has um, used it as well as it could be used. And uh, I think it's, it certainly needs to be promoted more and used better. Um, you know, I can't see a hospital patient's notes because they write in ink and pen on the notes. You know, you know they don't have an electronic notes system um, so there's no way I can see that. I mean, I can certainly share my electronic record with the care portal, which any doctor at the hospital can see. But if they're writing on ink on paper, that's not going to go onto the care portal. The, the letters take weeks and months to come out. Um, so when a patient contacts me to say, you know, I've been in hospital and they've changed my medication, I then have to get one of my admin team to find the discharge summary from the hospital, which hasn't been finished because the junior doctor's left and gone to another hospital, et cetera, et cetera. But these are all things we know about and we really wish we could improve. And they're slowly getting better, I hope. In terms of snail mail versus text, well, it's funny because I get the, num the number of complaints I get about, oh, the doctor will only contact me by text. They don't ever see me. They never ever write. They never write to me anymore. They always send me a text, a text message or an email. So you've got two sides of the same story there, haven't you? Uh, we are actually using something called AccuRx and text messaging from our systems to a lot of patients. So if your practice isn't doing that for you, that might be because they've not ticked the box to say you've given them consent. And we can't give you a send you a text message without your consent because it, we don't want it to go to the wrong person. But a lot, I mean, all the practices in Lincolnshire are using some form of online text messaging. Um, we love it because I can send you a patient information leaflet um, without having to print it off with my ink and my paper. It's brilliant. Um, in terms of public health, I mean, you, I'm obviously preaching to the converted. I mean, that's one of the things I think we miss again and again in, in all our discussions is if you improve people's lives through their jobs, through their housing, through their education, they don't get ill and they won't need the health service and put me out of a job. Fantastic. Um, you know, that's what we need to do. I totally agree. Just, Just very quickly, quickly please. Please. Just saying, well, thank you very much indeed for that. I have no intention of putting you out of a job, but I do want to reduce your workload. Mm, so more fitness would be a good thing, wouldn't it? It comes back to us in this chamber, really. It's our responsibility to ensure the public are healthy and don't trouble you unnecessary. And by the way, I always tick the boxes. They can have any information they like. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chairman. OK, I've got Councillor Bilton next. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say myself, I'm sure I don't commitment, would like to thank GPs for all the hard work they actually do. I, I personally see them as the frontline troops of health. Um, unfortunately, Councillor Woodliffe stole my thunder because that was the, the section I was going to pick up on. And 
public health, it mentions public health. Now, I'm not very good on health, but is public health part of the county council? Is that where the function comes from? Because as thing, we have got a breakage. There's a breakage and the public health possibly isn't working. Uh, there was a headline in Lincoln last week. We across Lincoln, we've got an 18 year life expectancy difference between four miles apart. Now, there are reasons for that as well, but it is transport, it is housing, it is food, it is health. Um, these are major points and I don't know who to take it to, but somebody could comment, you know, the public health side of it probably isn't working. And if this is a scrutiny committee, then maybe that's where the scrutiny should be, really. John, you'd like to come in? Yeah, clearly. Um, uh, uh, we have a director of public health here in Lincolnshire, obviously works as part of the council's team, and we have a, a health and wellbeing board uh, here, uh, which Councillor Woolley is the chair of and I'm the vice chair of, which uh, really focuses its, its efforts on how we are improving health and wellbeing across the county. Um, but the points that you make and, and Councillor Woodliff make uh, are absolutely spot on in terms of improving the health of the people we serve probably about 20% of it is something the NHS could possibly do something about it. The vast majority is actually uh, well beyond the remit of the NHS. So it is it is the economy, it's if you've got a job, it's education, it's housing, exactly the points that, that Kieran makes in his, his, his point here. I, I, I think probably you know, this might be a matter that uh, the Director of Public Health obviously is our, our, our expert on in the county, uh, may may wish to be be approached for, but we uh, I think what he would describe to you is a lot of work that we're all trying to do together across local government uh, uh, with with the uh, 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 economy with education providers obviously with the NHS as as, as well uh, uh, with housing to try to to make inroads into this. But this is a this is a monumental uh, challenge here in Lincolnshire and obviously across the the country uh, as well. You're quite right about the life expectancy range uh, between one part of Lincoln and the outskirts of Lincoln. Actually, there's an even bigger one between, I think it's, it's South Ward in Gainsborough, um, Southwest. Southwest Ward, thank you, and uh, Bourne as well. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. Uh, I think it's completely uh, unacceptable uh, as well. Uh, but this is, this is a massive, massive uh, challenge for us. And again, as we come back, as we develop the integrated care system approach. It is as much about a concern for the health and well-being of the population as it is for uh, the actual quality and integration of care they receive. And we can only do this together, together between the NHS, the County Council and all of the partners uh, who we work with in the, in the county. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we can certainly raise with our colleagues in public health. I will say that we do have an annual update from the Director of Public Health where he has highlighted everything that you've mentioned and we normally have sort of questioned him on it. But there is that partnership working that needs to be done. It's about prevention more than anything else. And that's the one area that is consistently pushed by that they want to go down the lines of prevention, that they need to work with their NHS colleagues. So there is that drive there and they are actively trying to make inroads, but we will speak to our colleagues either way. Thank you for that. The other one that was picked up on obviously transport, and I think that's another area that the County Council have got, what's the word I'm looking for? Influence, shall we say? There is influence. Every councillor in this chamber this morning has mentioned that their area doesn't get the transport they think they ought to have. It's a County Council matter. The County Council could deal with it if if they chose to. Um, so sitting in the chamber and moaning about it doesn't necessarily get it fixed. No, and again, I would say, I'm not sure if it was in the earlier paper, I think it was in the acute services review that there is ongoing work currently between the, between the County Council and the NHS looking at these issues because it's undoubtedly one of the major problems. I know in, in other areas, you only have to look at places like Doncaster, they've got interlinked buses which will take you from one hospital to another. So absolutely, there's an issue there, but that work is ongoing. Okay, I've got Councillor Parkin, did you say that you wanted to come in still? Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yeah, Councillor Park. 
Um, the public health stuff I could go on about all day, every day. Um, you know, my life's been transformed by taking those messages seriously. If exercise was a pill, if you could combine the benefits of proper, proper aerobic activity into a pill and give it to people, we would be, be transformed. And yet time, and, and the messages are so clear, we, we can't, and th this is, this is, there's a bit of a pushback here to me for members of the public. The messages are known, the messages are clear. We're not in the 60s and 70s where people weren't aware, we know. So there comes a point where I think, yes, we have to scrutinise clinicians and, but we also have to scrutinise our communities actually and ask if they are not expect i'm not saying that we you know that there's an issue of taxation or whatever but there has to be a message and i think we as councillors can be part of that is do you have realistic expectations of the nhs if you are not then combining that with all that you can do as an individual um and i or i could i could go on all day about it but i won't and <laughs> um, the other points that i've met I've, I've got down here um i think there is a disparity between the surgeries and that i'm really lucky in that in that I'm, i can't fault my gp said you absolutely love them um is there a process of peer review or would you consider a process of peer review i know that one of the things that happened within children's services was that the schools actually peer reviewing each other out of the ofsted and ccg arena not ccg um cqc arena that could be really powerful i think and then um some of those they then had kind of the autonomy to how much they actually shared and identified with it and it was a really useful process i don't know if there's anything that we, we could we could do that way um i just we've talked a lot about gps here but i just want to give a shout out to nurse practitioners in our practices i mean i remember growing up and i remember when my children were very young that um we had our family gp now my girls who are in their early 20s and late teenage years and mom we have a nurse practitioner Gemma who it, when I actually think about the relationship she has with my kids it's similar to that old that old relationship that you would have with the GP and if I do have a medical concern for the the kids know what we're we is it we're going to go and see Gemma you know could, could we, and I think that's really powerful actually in that you know she's a very very young nurse who the practice have really nurtured and kept and you can see that she's really flourished but her relationships I think are fantastic and it does so it doesn't have to be taught with everyone's mentioned GPs but I think it's a much wider issue than that um my other question is and again, this comes from somebody now. I've got older teenage kids and elderly parents texting to go with the age group. Don't they? Um, a situation where my dad had an acute need that was dealt with at hospital. I'm not going to go to details, but then it, it wasn't handled brilliantly well. And I think some of the responsibility for that lies with my dad in terms of not asking the right questions 